Can you explain the importance of the collaboration process between writers, directors, and producers? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to add another category, which is actors, okay? Writers, directors, producers, and actors. First of all, the, um, the whole process of making a film is a collaboration process. That if a writer didn't want to collaborate, they would write a novel. If a director didn't want to collaborate, he might do something else. Yeah, in fact, he might become a painter or something like that. The storytelling through film is, by design, collaboration. The problem is there's so little collaboration that actually goes on or su such inefficient or ineffective collaboration going on. So there is collaboration, but what we, Michael and I are doing is with this uh, process beyond collaboration, that's what we're calling it, is we're addressing that collaboration process and trying to explore how people can be more effective can be more efficient, how writers can learn how to not only work with directors, but work with actors, work with producers. In fact, those four categories, how they can learn a language, a common language that they can all speak to each other, because rarely do they ever speak to each other, except usually just directors and actors, and that's it. Right. Anything to add? No. <laughs> I agree completely with what he said. I just think it's a the best movies come when those elements work together. For one thing, I think it's essential that those people find some common vision for the movie. I think the biggest mistakes come when the writer has a vision, the script is taken over by somebody else, and they, they neither replace it with their own or understand the writer's vision, and now it just becomes a patchwork of different ideas about what that story is, rather than a unified idea of, this is what we're trying to say with this film. And collaboration is really going to enable them to do that. Why does the collaboration break down? Fear. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of fear and mistrust, I think. Fear, I think too many artists, all four of those categories, fear that they don't know enough about the story, don't know about enough about what they're doing, and it'll show. So it's best not to talk to um, for instance, a director who doesn't want to work with the writer. And you say, why not? The writer created this script that you are going to make into a film. Why wouldn't you want to talk with him? Why wouldn't you want to collaborate with him? And a lot of directors that I work with, and I've worked with them here in overseas Europe, and it's almost a consistent thing that the director feels he has to be the authority. He has to be the leader. And if he starts collaborating with other people, it may be exposed that he doesn't know what he's doing to enough depth, understanding of it. So best just to stay away from that. I think directors too, and even producers, a lot of times feel if we let the writer to continue to be involved once they've turned, on the script, turned over the script, then if we start to try new things or try new ideas, they're gonna dig their heels in and not be cooperative. And so the writer gets pushed out of the picture. And this has always been the way in Hollywood since the beginning, really. And so the writer is kind of left behind and everybody else goes to it. Whereas good writers, writers that I've worked with many times, relish the idea of working with people and changing their own scripts for the better and working together to realize their vision even more strongly. But there's just so seldom that opportunity You've got to have a director that is willing and not afraid of bringing the group together, working with writers, and everybody standing up for their vision of the story before you decide this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I think there's also a fear, and when I say fear, I don't mean just the director or just the director, writer, actor, producer. The f this is really interesting. A fear that somebody else Okay, I'm the director. My fear that somebody else, the writer, the actor, or the producer, will have a better idea. A really good idea. And now what do I do with that? If I'm not confident with my own craft and what I'm doing, if I'm not secure in my vision mm -hmm. of where I want to take this movie, I can be threatened by a good idea. And I mean a really good idea. And many times, the writer will have that good idea. The writer can say, well, I always saw this scene being done this way. 
there's a vision. So now the, the writer has a vision of how the scene might be played or where it might be played or the location or the tone. And a, a secure director can listen to that and go, great idea. I'm going to use part of it or some of it or none of it and still feel confident feel like his authority has not been threatened. A weak director will hear that great idea and feel threatened because he doesn't know what to do with it. So basically the writer's gone. The, you know, that's why let's not let the writer in. Same thing Michael's saying because, but the other thing is my feeling because of the collaboration process between these four elements, producer, director, writer, and actors, there is the potential, which is what I'm always going for, that if we all get together and we all collaborate and we all share our ideas and our visions for this movie that we're all working to make this one thing happen, the chances are that the final product that we will create, if we're all open to each other, trust each other, and are uh, confident and secure, the final product will rise above what any one of us could have done alone. And we will at the end not know quite how it happened. And that's the magic of what can happen, but, this, but that means giving up control. Everybody. Director, writer, producers, actors, everybody has to give up control. The control is taken over by the creative process, not by another person, but by a creative process. And that creative process can then elevate the film. Well, collaboration sounds wonderful. And in a perfect world, all parties would come to the table with healthy self-esteem and a, uh, a willing to collaborate but we know that in real life that doesn't usually happen so let's say there's a writer sensitive maybe a loner by nature has to deal with a director that's a little more dominant and the process is not so collaborative what would you tell that screenwriter to keep themselves and the project still intact okay you want to start yeah uh, one suggestion I would make because I do this all the time when I'm working with clients or when I'm in a situation where a script is being developed and all of those people are in the room together. And that is, when someone confronts you with an idea or an objection to something you've written, don't defend and don't try and argue it, ask questions. Questions are a very powerful tool in any aspect of collaboration, I think. But what you want to say to the director is, Oh, so when did you start feeling this way? Or how do you see this character? Or what made you say that? Or try and get underneath the suggestion or the boneheaded comment because whatever they're saying, the truth of it is they had a negative emotional reaction to something in your script. And if they did, somebody else might. So what you want to get at is, what was the core cause of that and attack that and work that and then suggest something that you think might accommodate their concern but is different than what's already in the script. I don't think any good directors, some bad directors perhaps, but when I've been in those situations, nobody wants a writer who's going to be just a powder puff and cave at everything, but they don't want them to just dig in their heels and say, no, it's my way or the highway. They want someone who's going to be open to anything they say, maybe not agree with the specific solution of the problem, but jump in and say, okay, what can we do about this together? And I think questions will get to that. That's good. I like that. Um, for, for my, because I work mostly with directors and directors, um, run into a lot of obstacles, which can be producers or writers or, or actors. Um, and when I say the obstacles, the resistance, because you're talking about when someone has resistance or is not available. Um, my first thing is uh, a little different than Michael's, um, although going along the same lines in a way, is realize that any resistance usually comes out of fear. There's a fear of something. And just be sensitive. Don't try to attack it. Don't try to, you know, don't, don't be the psychologist and try to deal with, but realize that that resistance, if you have an actor who's resisting or, or a writer, director working in the writer and the writer says, no, I can't do that, I can't do that, doesn't mean they can't do it. There's some fear going on, fear that maybe you can't do it well, fear that it's going to destroy the, the film or whatever. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of resistance. And then I say to directors who are working with writers, if you have a point of disagreement, let's say about a scene and what the scene is about or whether, even if the scene belongs. If you stay on the point of disagreement, this is similar to what I think is Michael saying, you have a problem. 
because somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And you've got a real problem. You know, let's say it's a discussion of whether or not we even need this particular scene. My suggestion to the directors is go back to a point of agreement, which means get away from the point of disagreement, get away from the argument about this scene or this character or this moment. Go back to something that's more general. Okay, we agree that in this part of the journey, this is what the character is going through. This is where, yes, okay. And then move from a point of agreement towards the point of disagreement to find out where it starts to fall apart. And you may find out it's not that scene that's the problem, it was something before that you're both feeling. In other words, get out of the argument and get into a point of agreement and start to move towards the problem area. So to recap, it sounds like uh, ask questions, don't defend, don't be combative. Um, try not to be too passive, but try not to be too much of a fighter in the room as well. Find that middle ground and then find something that you both agreed on in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Take yourselves back to that win-win, so mm -hmm. to speak, instead of pointing out what you don't agree with and then circle back, kind of give it a breather, sounds like. Well, it's, it's not so much circle back because that sounds like you're going to attack. If, if there's a point in the script that I, I as a director am having a trouble with and the writer just can't see it, and I'm aware they can't see it or don't want to address it, I'll say, okay, fine, well, let's, let's, let's talk about something else. And I'll, I will go back in the script. I'll go back in, either in the script or in the story. It might even be if this moment between, let's say it's a husband and a wife in the script, we're having a disagreement. I say, okay, let's go back. And we'll talk about the relationship and where the relationship is going and how the relationship between these two characters is evolving. Now I'm moving slowly towards this point. Now, many times when I've done this, I've come close to this point and realize, oh, it's me. I'm the problem because I was seen in a different way. And sometimes I've done this and I've, now I'm able to see where the writer was going because we're walking through the story, either walking through the script or walking through the relationship towards the problem area rather than trying to address the problem. It's the difference of putting a band-aid on it, on the wound or trying to figure out what caused the wound in the first place. And so you've got to back away from it and then come up to it again. Do you think that's a common thing for most people to be that aware, self-aware, that, that they were sort of the cog in the wheel? No. Okay. So. <laughs> no, the most common thing is people think, I'm right, you're wrong, fix it. Change it. Change your performance, change the script, change whatever. Um, depending on who you are, I mean, if it, I'm talking about directors now because directors say this is the way I want. It's like Michael was saying before about <coughs> um, you know, a script is written and it goes on to a director and the director will dismiss the writer and then start to make the script his own story, which happens in Europe a lot. In fact, in Europe, a script is sold and the writer's gone and the director's got it and then the producer is then waiting for the, what they call the director's script. The director will rewrite it and make it his script. And I go, well, what happened to the writer? And a lot of my friends in Europe are writers, and they say, well, no, no, he, that's his job. He, his job is to. So that, which I don't agree with, it, because that's not collaboration at all. That's sort of acquisition and then modification, and then it becomes somebody else's story. But if we're talking about the collaboration process, then there has to be this open communication. There has to be the willingness, as Michael's saying, to listen to really consider, this is another thing, consider the other person's objection. Maybe they're right. As horrible as it feels to you, maybe they are right. Or maybe, they're, which Michael did suggest, maybe they're onto something that is right, but you can't, you can't see it yet, and maybe they can't see it, but they can feel it. And, there's, you know, and it, I think we all have to back away from the argument, back away from the battle of winning. Because when someone, again, when someone wins, the project loses. I think, I don't think you need to be quite so walking on eggs as you kind of described about, it's like, well, be nice and don't be combative. I don't think being combative is always a bad thing. But I think what you got to ask yourself is, am I fighting for the story and the character or am I fighting for a specific choice I made that I think must be the best and I won't consider anything else. I mean, when, when we work on scripts together, the point you always want to go back to is, who are these characters? Mm -hmm. What do they want? What is this story about? 
And if you can get agreement on that, then sometimes if you really think you're being more consistent with the story, I think you have to stand up for that. And you can be combative, but at a certain point, it'll become counterproductive if you just both lock horns and get nowhere. I, I don't think anybody wants somebody to just be sweet all the time, but be very clear on what you're fighting for. Because if it's this line of dialogue has to stay, that's being too picky or too, too silly. It's more, is this the story we said we wanted to tell? Yeah, and that, that line, this, is this the story we wanted to tell, is just pretty much what I was saying, going back to a point of agreement. We're trying to tell this story, right? In other yeah. words, you go, and if everybody says, yes, that's where we are, now we're, now we're in a place where we're all agreeing. Okay, now let's look at what we're doing. And very possibly, the writer, the director, whoever is, who is fighting for a point of view can make a very strong case for that point of view based on this is the story we want to tell. And it's either, and it's somebody's, you know, the chances are that other people are going to go, oh, now I see what you're doing. Now I get, understand why it's there or why it's that way. Yeah, I, I mean, the biggest difficulty comes when that question has never been asked. What, what's what is, this about? I, uh, oftentimes when I'm brought in and a project is well down the road, the first thing I ask, and I keep asking it again and again is, so what's this movie about? You're, you're all caught up, everybody else that's so close to the script because they've been working on it for weeks or months or years sometime, is, well, it's got to be this, and the budget is this, so we're shooting here. And I say, what is this about? What are, what are you trying to say? What's the overall theme of this? What are we exploring here? And get everybody all the way back to that ground level idea. Because if you can get everybody considering that and get them all in the same place, it will greatly at least improve the arguments. Because then they're all arguments toward a common goal. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And, I, and also, my experience has been a lot of when I've asked that question, when I say, what is the story really about? I put in the word really <laughs> to try to get them deeper. What's it really about? Because I don't want to, well, it's a story about a husband and wife. I said, I know, I read the script. What is it really about? That a lot of assumptions that are made even by writers, but directors and uh, producers is, well, you read the script, don't you know? Mm -hmm. You know, assumption is if you've read the script, you know what it's about. I go, no, I don't. But it gets down to what are you trying to say with this? What is the themes? What is it you, the director, the writers, the actors, what do you want to say? What do you want to say with this story? And if we can all agree on that, you're right. Then we have a foundation. We always have a place to go back to, say that's what we're doing. That's the house we're building. Mm -hmm. Let's not argue about the beams and the, and the nails. This is the house we're building. And if, if that question can't be answered, I think there are other questions you can ask to get to that. Like if, if nobody has really thought in that broad way or that deep way, then I would change the question to something like, how do you see this character? Usually the hero of the story. Just talk, let's talk about this character and say, who are they? What are they about? And you want to get to the point where you can ask, how is this character going to change in the course of this story? What's the character's arc? What do they have to learn? How, what kind of courage do they have to show? Because if you can identify that, in my mind, you've identified what the movie's about. Mm -hmm. Because whatever you want the audience to take away from the movie at that level, that's what the hero of the story has to learn mm -hmm. in the course of the story. Whatever courage that hero, hero finds is touching on, this is what the filmmakers are saying we should all learn in order to live a more fulfilled life. So start with the character if you can't jump right to the deeper, bigger issue, what's the story about? I have I, one of my favorite questions to ask writers, directors, producers, anybody. I say, you're making this film, here's, here's the script, here's the story, you're making this film. Imagine that it's finished, which they love. And imagine that it's finished and it's perfect. It's exactly what you wanted. And they go, okay. And I said, now imagine two, three hundred people are watching it, right? And the movie's over and they're going home or they're going to Starbucks, wherever they're going. Mm -hmm. What do you want them to be thinking about, worried about, fantasizing, talking about, discussing with each other? And most of the people look at me and go, I have no idea. I said, because well, I said, that's the power of your film. 
the power of your film is what happens to that audience the moment the movie's over and what they're taking out of the, not what they've experienced during just the two hours, but what they take out of there. And again, if we can start to identify that, then we're getting back to exactly what you're talking about, which is usually the hero's journey or the protagonist's journey. And it gets back to, this is what this story is all about. And this is the power of the story. Because mm -hmm. I say, if you're talking about the, the writing, the cinematography, the acting, the locations, your, your film doesn't work. Yeah. And I'll be, we're also now talking beyond, or before collaboration. I mean, this better be questions that the screenwriter is asking as they're working on the script before yeah. anybody else sees it. This better be, these better be questions the producer is asking before he options it or the director is asking before they have that first meeting. Mm -hmm. They've got to start thinking in those kinds of terms and not just in, won't this be funny? Won't this be a cool scene? Won't this make money? If only we cast so-and-so, we'll have a hit. <laughs> oh, they'd never think that way. No, no, that doesn't happen. Michael, what would you tell that beginning screenwriter who's not yet had the opportunity to work with a director and, and banter back and forth about what that director sees appropriate for the film? What would you tell that beginning screenwriter in terms of creating characters and story when they've never actually been in the trenches? Okay, well, I, I can talk to the writers, and when I coach writers, I can talk about my approach to story and the principles of story, but then it's Mark that could probably be more informed about talking about what the director's going to look for. So, for instance, when I first start working with a screenwriter on a new project, as I said, I start with a lot of questions to get a sense of how do they see the characters, what's their vision for the story, and so on. But, for example, one of the things that's key in creating the hero of the story is a couple things. One, we need to meet that character living their everyday life before the story gets underway. We've got to, we've got to have a setup so we can see who is this character, who has this character been for some time before the train leaves the station, before the action gets big, before they're up against the obstacles and going after the big goal. So who is that? And in that portrait, what I also want to see is how is that character stuck? How is that character limited in their living? How is their fear or wound from the past or whatever it might be keeping them from being fulfilled or fully individuated? So how are they telling themselves their life is fine, but it's just sort of tolerable because then the writer's going to have to present them with a desire that's going to take them out of that stuck place and force them to confront their fears. So I can talk about that aspect of the character and how you can create that empathy with the character and introduce them that way, but I'd be interested in hearing what you'd say. So when, as a director, you get the script, are those the things you're looking for at the beginning of the screenplay too, or are there other elements knowing you're going to have to direct actors in the role that you're going to be eager to see in a well-written script. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what you're saying is great. Um, but I mean, I'm just thinking, as I was listening to you, Mike, I was just thinking of when I read a screenplay, um, and I've, a lot of the directors I've worked with have the same thing. We're dreading the first 10 pages. In other words, and hoping in the first 10 pages, you will capture my imagination with exactly what you're talking about. Can you, within a few minutes, introduce me to a character who I get to know in his regular life and then introduce to me a problem, whether it's the inciting incident, that I am so intrigued, I have no idea what the hell's going to happen. In other words, can you, this is the big challenge, can you get me in 10 pages outside of my director's head? In other words, where I will stop directing. And by that I mean because many times we as directors are reading scripts and going, how do I direct this? How do I direct this? How do I direct this? The good scripts, but that, that voice has stopped. Mm -hmm. I'm now with this character and his or her situation and, and I realize I've been pulled out of that function, that mechanical function of directing and I've been pulled into the story that I, all I want to do is keep reading. I need to keep reading. So I'm looking in the first 10 or so pages to be captured by an event and a situation that now I don't, literally don't want to put the script down. 
And if that doesn't happen in 10, 20, or 25 pages, then I'm getting really discouraged. And then my director brain is going, well, if I was directing this, how would I save it? Mm -hmm. How would I fix it? And now I'm going into what you do so brilliantly. I'm going into script consulting, script, and do you know what I mean? I'm going into yeah. script fixing, and I don't want to go there. I don't want to be in that. So it's, it's a, lot, a lot of it is, I as the director, when I'm reading a script, and let's assume it's a film that eventually I do make, want to make, and I do make, I am at that moment in a very, very critical point in my process. I am the first audience, okay? I'm reading it and whatever reactions I'm having to this script now, and if, it, if it's going well, this is what I'm going to want to replicate months or a year later when it's up on the screen. In other words, the emotional journey I've been taken on. So this emotional journey that I'm on, if it's truly an emotional journey that I've engaged with the characters, involved in the characters, worried about the characters, cheering for the characters, hating the characters, whatever it is, I'm in relationship with these characters, and I get to the end and I go, oh wow, that was a ride, and I realize I wasn't directing. Yeah. Then my job for the next year that it might take to make the film is to create a film that will do that, what just happened to me, to an audience of 100, 200, 300 people, but I'm gonna do it with a film. If I don't have that experience, then I know it's a long road. I'm gonna to have to do a lot of work to try to create an emotional journey. I, I'm curious because this happens to me a lot, or I, I find writers making what I think is this mistake often. And it's not that the script is too slow to get going, it's almost that it's too fast that it tries to get going. Mm -hmm. I think one of the difficulties a lot of newer writers I think in particular have or face is they hear that old maxim you got to grab the reader in the first 10 pages mm -hmm. and so they think something big and exciting and you know filled with special effects or something has to happen right away and that actually is detrimental to the story because it doesn't give us the chance to get to know the character mm -hmm. doesn't introduce them do you find that, I mean, do you have that same reaction? Do you find that sometimes it feels like the writer's sort of trying to jump the gun mm -hmm. and, and get to the good stuff, so to speak, instead of really letting us be with a character and get inside that character before things kick into gear? Yeah, and, and, yeah exactly. And I think, you know, the, the question is when you say get to the good stuff, what is the good stuff? Yeah. Some of the good stuff is a lot of action and explosions and political intrigue and like that. And quite honestly, I look at that and say, that's fascinating. I have no idea what's going on. And more importantly, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care that this army is going that way or this political explosion or there's an assassination attempt against this president or something. I go, fine. You know, and I'm sure visually it'll be very interesting, but I don't care, which means I have nobody to care about. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are a lot of people there, but I don't care about. So when you say the good stuff, sometimes the good stuff is the most seemingly mundane, benign thing. I mean, American Beauty is a great example. The good stuff is a fantasy. Mm -hmm. There's a sexual fantasy that Lester Burnham has at a basketball game. And, I, and by that time, I know this character so well. And he has this little epiphany about uh, some, that something's ignited inside him. And I'm going, I'm intrigued. You know, so, so the question is, what is the good stuff? And I think a lot of people think, well, I have to do something big and splashy. You don't. You have to do something startling, I think. Something unexpected, that, but something that is logical and rational, but un unexpected. But it can be small. Absolutely. It can be, one, yeah. it can be a comment. I mean, in um, ordinary people, actually, the inciting incident is over a serving of French toast. When the mother, to me, when, when she says, here's your favorite meal, he says, I don't want it. She takes it and she puts it in the garbage disposal and says, you can't save French toast. And the husband says, he'll eat it later. No, you can't save it. And I, right at that moment, I can feel the whole family cracking. And it's over French toast. So that, to me, is a big event. If you look at it on the screen, it doesn't look big. It feels big. And that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Because it's so illustrative of all the conflict that is going on and pushed down beneath mm -hmm. the surface, especially in that movie, yeah. because the whole MO of that mother and that family is we can't let any conflict show. Mm -hmm. And 
And that's it. I, I mean, one of the key principles I talk about all the time is your primary goal as a storyteller is you've got to elicit emotion, and emotion grows out of conflict. But at the beginning, when we meet the hero, a lot of times is what is the conflict from the past or what's going on on the inside with this character that has been pushed down so they can avoid any conflict. But we become aware of it because we see the banality or, or the sadness or the missing piece in that character's life. Yeah. So the conflict is there, it's just not explosive yet. Mm -hmm. The must-haves for the first 10 pages, any... <laughs> Have to meet the hero. Have to show the hero living his or her everyday life before anything extraordinary occurs that's going to move the story forward. You can have something extraordinary if it's part of that character's everyday life, but it can't be the thing that is going to get the hero moving toward the climax yet. It's static in a certain way. It's the everyday life. And the other must-have is you must create empathy with that character. We've got to connect with that character psychologically. Now, to me, the key ways a writer would do that is you either get us to feel sorry for the character, make the, make the character the victim of some undeserved misfortune. So in Avatar, at the beginning, we find out that he's been crippled in the war and he's just lost his brother who was killed and that's why he's there taking his place. So all of that is designed to immediately get us to sympathize with this character and that creates this empathy or psychological connection. Another way is to create jeopardy for the character, put their life in danger if it's an action movie, put their job or their love life in danger, anything that's of importance to them because we identify with characters we worry about. And the third way is you make them a nice person, good-hearted, generous, kind, show them as well-liked by other characters. So you have to have at least one or two of those as you introduce the hero so that your audience or your reader will actually become that character psychologically. I mean, that's what you're going for. To me, movies are participatory. They aren't something we observe, they're something we step into. So in Titanic, we're the ones on the sinking ship, we're the ones falling in love with Leo DiCaprio or whatever, because you establish this empathy. Those to me are the essentials. That's and good. How can we identify with someone that in real life we would never be? You know, if, if you want to say, Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman, well, that would never be something that I would do, but we still root for her, we still like her. Well, if you're a writer, I think you have to realize identification has nothing to do with who we are in real life. It only has to do with emotion. It only has to do with empathy, because we are, there's nothing in real life that would make me like... Uh, Sully or whatever his name is in Avatar. I'm nothing like Indiana Jones. I'm nothing like the hero of Shrek. But that isn't what, that's not why we go to movies. We don't really go to movies to become characters that are so much like we are. We can see those people by going home. Yeah. And that's, those are the people we want to get away from. What you want to do is create that empathy using those tools so we become them on an emotional, psychological level. That's the fun of it. So we become a space traveler 200 years in the future. We become a soldier of fortune. We become an ogre, whatever. We become a woman uh, on the Titanic. So those two things are really better thought of as disconnected completely, I think. Yeah, also, also along that line, I agree totally with what Michael's saying, but that we, we connect with characters on an emotional level. And if you, you take any of the characters that you've mentioned or that Michael's mentioned, and you say, okay, that person's life is nothing like mine. I am not Shrek. I am not Indiana Jones. I'm, I'm nothing. But my life is so much like him because I suffer and experience all the emotions that he goes through. I, I, I have feelings of abandonment. I have feelings of, of pride. I have feelings of discouragement. In other words, I can identify with him emotionally. Not that I want to be him or be like him, but I like to know that he is actually not that different from me. In other words, there is a similarity, but the similarity is on the emotional experiential level, not on the action level or the career level 
Or if you take, like you mentioned, Titanic, there you have the two lovers on Titanic. Do we all understand falling in love? Yes, hopefully we all do. Do we all understand being in danger? Yes, do we do. Do we all understand fears of death and dying? Yes, we do. Have we ever been on the Titanic? No. Or sinking boat? No. I mean, in other words, we haven't been there. But what we can, the experiences that these a good film will allow us to have with the characters, with with this, not identifying with the character except on the emotional level, and that's where we get hooked, and that that's how we we um, emp not only empathize that we project ourselves in, into them and we play them. When you read a script, you play all the characters. Even when you watch a film, you actually project yourself inside the character to go on not the um, adventure of Indiana Jones, but the experience, the emotional experience, that ride, that's the ride you want to go on. And, that, and that's what makes us connect potentially with this film on a very, very deep level. It used to be when I, when I used to work for production companies and it seemed like every year or two I'd get this, people would come in and pitch ideas. And there was always someone who would come in and have a pitch like, this movie, the script I wrote, it's going to be huge because it's about a boulder. And then they'd say, do you know that 30 million people in this country bowl? And I, my answer was always, well, first of all, if they're bowling, they're not going to the movies, so we're not <laughs> going to get any money out of them. But that's not why people go to the movies, to see people who are doing what they already do. It has to do with just what Mark said. It's, it's not situational, it's emotional. It's, are they feeling what I have felt? at least to some extent, maybe not as big as they do, but if I experienced this before on the inside, that's what creates the connection. Mm -hmm. Michael, when the cameras were off, we just started discussing the title of Film Courage, and you were gracious sure. and complimented the name. Um, you refer to the word courage, and you talk about that in your classes and the work that you do in terms of... Yeah, I was saying I loved the name of your company or the enterprise calling the film Courage because at the core of really the essential thing I talk about is fear and courage always with the character. I believe characters at the, at the core of everything when you're a storyteller. And what I'm always interested in and what I always want to encourage the writer to look for is what is the fear that is crippling in some way the character at the beginning of the story and how do they find the courage to overcome that? I talk when I lecture about the terms I use are identity and essence because to me this isn't present in all screenplays. You could have a big action script that doesn't involve a character arc but for most of the, of the stories that are layered the character is suffering from some wound. Something happened in the past before the movie began that was so painful that they believe they've dealt with it but they've actually sort of suppressed it. They haven't blacked it out. They know it happened but they think that doesn't bother me anymore. So in Shrek it was his rejection. Um, or in, in uh, Titanic it was Rose getting drummed in by her mother the idea if you don't have a man to take care of you you're not going to survive. So those, those wounding experiences created this deep-seated fear and that stuckness that I talked about at the beginning is just them living under that fear and it's preventing them from really doing what they need to do to be, fully, to be fulfilled. Then as the writer what you have to do is you have to give that character a goal. You have to dangle a carrot in front of your hero that is so enticing either because it's such a big reward or it's to prevent something horrible from happening that they are desperate to go after it. So that's the plot of your story is the journey as they go after that goal. But the inner journey is about them in pursuing that goal realizing I'm never going to get it unless I can find this courage that I don't have because I'm too afraid of this wound from the past. Of, uh, so they start in this identity, this false self, and they have to find a way to get to their essence and who they truly are as they gradually find this courage to achieve the goal. And the rule is they can't get the goal in the end of the movie unless they found the courage. And if they do find the courage, they've got to get the, they've got to win. They've got to get the girl or find the buried treasure or stop the serial killer or whatever that goal might be. So it's that intertwining of that outer journey of the plot and the inner journey that the hero takes of transformation that really interests me when I talk about story and script. But 
I really want to ask Mark, because we haven't really talked about this ever before, is that I, I, this idea of fear and courage, or fear in particular, is that something you push hard when you're working with actors and getting performance? Is it one of the elements, or, or does that just emerge from other things? Is there something else that you say, look for this about the character more than anything? Well, it, it's interesting, because as I was listening to you, um, I had some thoughts, which will answer your question. Because number one, you're talking about the fear and the courage of the character, in the character. And because most of my work, and you're working with writers and, and screenplays, most of my work is working with directors and directors working with actors. Mm -hmm. So I'm working in that world. I'm working with this group called directors, this group called actors, and eventually there is the character, and eventually that character is in a story. Mm -hmm. And so as I was listening to you, I said, yeah, because what I'm dealing with a lot before I even get to the with your question about the character and their fear and their courage, I'm dealing with the fear and courage or lack of courage of the director mm -hmm. and the actor. Forget the character for a moment. Right. In other words, a director's fear of even talking to an actor. You know, the, the, uh, a lot of directors fear, I mean, too many directors are afraid of actors and too many actors are afraid of directors and it's, it's, it's a disease that's been going on ever since. So a lot of what I'm dealing with is uh, dealing with a director's fear of talking to act, act with an actor and his courage, not as his courage to talk to an actor, but his courage to feel that he is capable of maintaining his authority while collaborating with an actor. Mm -hmm. do, do you know, to, to get sure. a, in other words, the courage within himself, nothing, nothing to do with <coughs> um, overpowering the actor. Then dealing with the actor, and then dealing with the actor's fear, and the, a lot of this has to do with control, which is similar to your characters. <coughs> For the actor's fear, which is the director's fear too, of giving up control. Too many artists, too many directors and too many actors want to control everything. Act, directors want to control the whole film, which is a big problem. Actors want to control their performance, which is a big problem. They should both give up that and give over to the character. Because that's all we're there for, is to create the character. We're not, I'm not there to direct, I'm there to help an actor create a character. The actor's not there to act, the actor's there to allow the character to live and breathe and then we get into, eventually we get into who is the character. But I've got to get past these other fears mm -hmm. within these artists called directors and actors before I can even get to dealing with the character in a, in a deep way. And then yes, we get, once we can get directors, I have to clarify this. I was going to say directors directing actors because my way of working with directors, is, which Michael has seen, is I have a way of working with directors which is called not directing, I mean, a way of working with actors, not directing the actor, stop directing the actor, totally stop it <coughs> and direct only the character. In fact, there's a way, uh, this technique I have is, of shut, as you've seen, shutting down the character's brain. I can shut the, the, the actor, I'm sorry, shutting down the actor's brain. This way of talking to the character so that the actor's brain will actually shut down and the character's brain will take over so then the character can emerge and then once I'm inside, I can get inside the character very fast within less than a minute, get inside the character and then what I'm stimulating inside the character is the fears that mm -hmm. exist within the character based on the script as I understand it. And then hopefully it's also stimulating the source of possible potential courage to deal with all the elements that are in the script. Do you link those two things? I mean, if you have an actor, which I assume is m most of the time, mm -hmm. who is afraid to let go and give the performance, mm -hmm. do you use that real fear that they have to connect it with the no. character's fear? Or no. is that a no. wrong no. direction? No, no, if, if I use, because if I try to use that fear, then I'm stimulating that fear. I'm, I'm, what I'm doing. What, Good what point. I'm, no, what I'm doing is through this this whole tech, my technique of working with actors with the interrogation process, which you've seen, um, is I'm bypassing that fear by by diminishing it. I, I just bypass it by diminishing the actor. Then suddenly the fear will go away. The actor's fear, the actor's real fear, biggest fear is they'll do a bad job. 
The actor's biggest fear that they won't give a good performance, they won't please the director, they won't please the writer, they won't please anybody, nothing's gonna, they won't please themselves. So what I have to do is bypass all of those fears mm -hmm. and actually take them off the table rather than dealing with them. But that's, and then the courage that I have to stimulate within the actor, which is not that, ironically, not that hard to do. Um, the courage to trust me. In other words, which is giving up control. Mm -hmm. Trust me that I will, um, I as the director will take them where they need to go. I will, the director will help them create the, and then once they do that, then what happens is, we could show you sometime this. Um, what happens is the character emerges. And the actor usually, and the actors I've done this with are amazed because they sit, after it's done, they go, oh wow, I didn't have to do anything. I said, no, you don't, you don't have to do anything. When actors realize that when they actually portraying the character, they have to do so little. In fact, most of the work a lot of actors do get in the way of the process because they try to control the process by acting, and by thinking. And I can shut down the acting and I can shut down the thinking and I can let the character think and let the character behave. You know, yeah. and I'm interested in the character's behavior, not the actor's behavior. It's not just amazing to the actor, it's amazing to watch. I think one of the reasons that we really wanted, or one of the reasons I anyway really wanted to do this event with Mark that we've been talking about, this beyond collaboration, is because even though we've known each other for decades now, I had never actually seen him teach one of his class and he, classes and he did an event at the Directors Guild and demonstrated this process he was just talking about. And it is astonishing to watch because I, who don't have any experience in the directing side of this, I'm all about story and script, I always imagined a director would say, okay, now you should walk over that way, or you should hold your hand here, or, or, or give it more, or give it less. And it's, it's amazing because he doesn't really talk to the actor at all, uh, except in the very beginning. He just, as quickly as he can, starts talking to the character in, 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 inside the skin of that actor and bringing that character out by directly engaging. And then you see how that brings out a performance that is just astonishingly better than the one that preceded it just because he was able to connect that directly. It's, it's, it was just a wonderful thing to experience and I think will be a wonderful thing for the screenwriters who come to this event to get to see because it's not completely disconnected. It's the writer, even in writing and creating those characters, has to be able to get to a level that they could, theoretically or inside their head, converse with their character, know their character well enough. I mean, I've often read scripts by writers and ask them questions about, well, well, uh, is, did, does this character have a college degree or, or what, what scares this person or whatever it might be? And they don't know. All they've thought about is, well, I know my character has to stop this serial killer. And I think that when writers can see you do that, it's really going to click into, wow, I could actually be doing that with my writing. I could be going deeper with the character and engaging them more directly in, in my head anyway in the creative process. Getting back to the writer um, and this technique, um, the whole technique is called the Travis technique, but this part of the Travis technique is the interrogation process and, and the, it's, it's a process of interrogating the character. It's, it's a very um, highly defined process and technique, but it's something that I've shown a lot of writers how to do. And I have this, like this one workshop I did in Munich, I think, I've done it a couple of places where it's just called meet your characters before you write your script. And I've had writers come in and say, okay, I've got this story. I say, okay, you know, give me a paragraph, a paragraph, short paragraph on each character. Tell me what the story is. Okay. Give me a paragraph on each character and just a short paragraph. So I go and we'll take, you know, typical family drama. I got the husband, the wife, a couple of kids, a couple of neighbors, and this is the story. And that's the thing. I, I say, okay, now I've read this and I know this, there's a group of actors in the room and they haven't read any of it, right? Or I can give it to them. And then I start interrogating these actors and turn them into those characters. And within minutes, the writer is sitting there in the room with all his characters. 
talking to each other, engaging with each other. And we did this <coughs> once in Munich on a full project and then the writer would say to me, well, these, I want to see what happens if these two characters have this situation happens. I said, okay, and then I would just work with the two, act, two, two actors and put them into that scene. This is an unwritten scene. And the writer's going, there's my scene. Or there's the idea of a scene. And, but the idea, now this gets back to the collaboration. If writers could think <coughs> about, I'm developing this story, what would happen if in the process I met with a few writers, I mean a few actors, worked with them, allowed them to be these characters for a moment so I could sort of get a sense of them outside of my head but viscerally in front of me and then let the actors go home and I'll keep working. In other words, meet the characters. One of the greatest untapped resources we have in this business, seriously, which we very rarely use, is the creative imagination of actors. We do a terrible thing. We write a script for a year, two years, months. Director comes along, gets an idea. Producer comes along, you know, now everybody's got an idea, and then they start casting. And what we're doing in the casting is we're trying to find those actors and there are thousands of them, the right actors to fit into the little boxes that we've created which are called characters. And we find the best actor to fit in that box and then basically we ask them to play that character and that's the way it works. What would happen if you brought in some actors long before that? And this is what we'll be doing in this weekend. Bring in actors long before that and say, okay, we're still in the development process. We don't know where, we don't even know quite where this story's gonna go maybe or how it's gonna, but bring, actors in and allow them to use their creative imagination and creative abilities to totally um, inhabit these characters for a while so you can see what's going to happen. Why not? <coughs> you know, it's like building a car. <coughs> BMW does not build just a beautiful car, a fast car, and then put it on the market and sell it. It tests it over and over. Every part of that car is tested and tested and tested, you know, to see that it's going to work right. But we, we don't test anything. We, suddenly, many times, <coughs> the first time a writer, and I've heard this from some writers, hear their words come out of an actor is when we're shooting the film. And I go, that's ridiculous. Or in the theater if the writer got <coughs> jettisoned before. It yeah, went yeah, 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 if, if, if the writer's lucky enough to be there. Yeah, like many times I, I did, <coughs> when I was working with, a, uh, with Mark Rydell and he would ask me, I did this process with a full script and we'd, we'd work for just one day on the script with the characters and then I'd do a reading at the end of the day and he'd come and see the reading and the one writer, who was a very well-known writer, came and sat and watched this. It was in a theater. He just heard a reading of his screenplay and he went, oh my God. He says, I've never heard my script read before like this. It's always the first reading after it's all cast. He says, but now that I've heard it, he says, I, I, now I know what it needs. And now I know where the problems are. So this, this way of working with actors earlier in the process as part of the development exploratory process is really crucial. And, and one of the things we're doing in this weekend is we're getting scenes from two different participants in the workshop that will be there and we're using those to go through this whole process. So we're not just saying, oh, look at this great performance in 12 Years a Slave or in Nebraska or whatever. We're taking this raw script or these scenes with the writer there and we're going to be talking first about what goes in and discussing it, but then they're going to see and the entire, all the participants are going to see these principles applied to something that isn't finished and isn't production ready and so on to see how this can be done and see the transformation of those scenes going through this entire collaborative process beginning to end. I think that's going to be exciting to me because I haven't had that experience before of getting to do that with one of my clients and taking it all the way to let's mold this with a director and by pulling the characters out of an actor. What if the actor is more in tune with the script than the director? Or do you not often see that? Do you see that the director is pretty honed in on the script, the beats of it, the characters? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a great question because it's that um, imbalance of not only understanding the script but being in, in tuned with the script is a big problem. Um, yeah, there are a lot of directors who believe they know the script well and we can talk about writer-directors too and sometimes just because they've written it 
uh, they believe they know the characters very deeply, profoundly. Sometimes they do, often they don't. Um, there are some actors who, when working on a script, will become very in tune with a character very, very quickly and very, very deeply. And it, again, it depends on the actor and how the actors work. Some actors work on a very superficial level, some work on a very deep level. The, the real challenge is to take everybody to a deep level directors and actors and the characters to the deepest level possible and not to settle for um, something that's um, more superficial or to be intimidated by the other. Actors can be intimidated by a director who seems to know so much about the character that the actor gets, gets frightened. This is part of the fear of talking about the fear like, oh, he knows the character so well. Oh my God, you know, what am I, you know, suddenly they feel intimidated or very often directors who feel intimidated by actors because um, especially really good actors. What One um, problem that some directors can have with really good actors, this problem is, is casting really good actors, seriously, is a really good actor can give you almost anything. And then you go, now what do I do? In other words, a director going, oh, how about if we play it this way, you know, have this kind of, and the actor does it, you go, wow, that's great. And I will say to the director, fine, what do you want? And the director doesn't know. And I say, well, now you've got a problem. You have the riches of talent in front of you and you don't know where you're going. In other words, you don't know the script well enough, you don't know the scene well enough, you don't know the characters well enough, you don't know your story well enough to be directing. And this is, again, why a lot of directors shy away from the actors. And I've heard directors say, you know, if I cast it well, I'm fine. Why do I need to do all that? If I get rid of these, are really good actors. They'll, they'll, they'll do it. And I'm working with one director now who's directing. He's a good director, but his directing is minimal. And he tells me with every scene he shot, it's, it's a movie that's shooting now, it's an independent film, and I've seen some of the scenes. He, every scene I say, I say, okay, how did it go? Great, they nailed it. As soon as I hear that, I know, we got a problem. <laughs> because he's saying that for every, it's either they nailed it or they hit it out of the park, every scene. And I go, it can't be true. That can't be, tr and not that I'm not doing a good job. I'm sure they're doing a good job. I'm sure they're doing the best job. But his um, assessment of their performance, I think, is always if it's highly emotional and intense, and they give a lot of energy to it, then it's fine. So he does. I don't think he and he wrote the script. And I don't think he knows the characters well enough. So is that why a director would be afraid of an actor? They're ex they're afraid of being exposed as a fraud, so to speak. It, yeah. it seems I've I've heard this for years that actors are, are excuse me that directors are so afraid of actors. I could see the reverse. It's intimidating. They hold all this power. They have the decision to cut you out of scenes, whatever. But in the reverse, it just seems so perplexing to me. Why directors are afraid of actors? Right. I'll give you one reason I think, and 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 quite honestly, Karen, I, sometimes I bring this up in front of directors to see what their response is, but. Really good. I've worked with a lot of really good directors, and a lot of really good directors are very knowledgeable about film, filmmaking, the technology, the cameras, the lights, the sounds, um, digital place replacement, CGI, all the equipment. We're going to shoot this with a steady cam. We're going to do all you know, and it's amazing what they know, and it's amazing what they can do, and it's amazing how they can visualize the film, and all that. And I'm just I'm impressed because that's not that's not my area of strength. And then they come, these same directors will come to an actor and suddenly they're shaky. And I think I know why. If I was working with a crew and I were talking about cameras and lights and angles, that's very manageable equipment. I can understand that. I can understand framing. I can understand, I can see immediately, am I getting what I want? Am I getting what I want in production design? Because I'm dealing with something that's tangible. Working with actors, there's nothing tangible. I'm working with an emotional system, a pool of emotions inside a character, and I don't know how to manage that. I don't know what I want, really. I can't define what I want. I can't tell that person, put a different lens on it and it'll work. I can tell you that to the camera, you know, no, not a 50, we're gonna go to a 35, it'll look better. I can do that. I can't say, so every, all the other directing, 
that I do with everybody else on the crew. It's all result. Give me this result. I want a, a different color blue. I want this to be bigger. I want this to be smaller. I want to shoot outside. What, it, I can talk in results and everybody can give me results. I can't talk that way to an actor because it won't work. I can't say I need more vulnerability because it won't work. In other words, I'm dealing with a human being and I don't have the tools and the techniques to know how to handle that. And the sad thing is I'm working with these actors and at the center of my $30 million movie, the only thing that's going to make it work is the actors. The rest of it won't make the movie work. Or this can bring it down. If the performances aren't good, if they're not strong, if it's not powerful, it's not telling the story I want to tell. It's, so that's the most important part of my movie and that's my weakest place. So I think the fear is because I have to talk to actors on more of a psychological level where I can talk with everybody else on a more mechanical level. So it's where they're almost afraid of their lack of um, emotional intelligence in some sense? I mean they know technical things. How you, you mean they're emotional? No, you mean the director's afraid of actors of their emotional intelligence? Or, or actually of the director's afraid of their own lack of emotional intelligence. F afraid of their lack of knowledge of what that person does and how do I talk to that person to, this is another big problem, how do I talk to that person to get them to do what I think they should do in this scene the way I imagine it when I read it because I think that'll work. Do you understand? Right, right. And, and I mean an intelligent director will know that the way he hears the scene, he or she hears the scene when they read it is maybe not the best way for it to play but how do I guide the actor through either a rehearsal process or while we're shooting to explore a range of possible um, emotional um, moments out of which I can make a really good scene. How do I do that? I mean it's a mystery and it's, and it's very different. So I think the, a lot of directors will just shoot a lot. Okay, let's do it again. What do you want? I just did it again. I, need, uh, I heard this on the set the other day, a long time ago. I need more, bigger emotions this time. And they asked, you know, now the actors do it. They did it louder. That's all they did. <laughs> bigger emotions. I, you know, I, need, I need more vulnerability. And, and I, my heart goes out to directors because I see them fighting to find the language with which to deal with a human being which is giving them a genuine emotional um, performance. And how do you modify that? It's easier to say, okay, now the, now the, the shadows are too sharp. I, I need it darker. I mean, or we'll, we'll fix that in color correction. Or, that's easy. I can't, I can't adjust an actor's performance in post-production. I can't do that. And so it's, it's the fact that that part of directing is all psychology. It's not technical at all. And they try to make it technical. Are there specific techniques a director can employ with an actor to get an authentic performance? Yes. Don't you love that answer? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. There, I, mean, there were, the, I mean, one way the director has to think about, you know, in terms of authentic performance, um, a little bit of what that means. That what that really means is the character that you're watching portrayed by the actor. The character is actually authentically thinking, feeling, um, intending, moving as the character intends. Authent authenticity in the character means this is exactly what's going on in the character, not something that's quote manufactured by the actor or planned by the actor. Uh, one thing I talk about a lot and I'm very serious about this that one of the things that's most detrimental to a good performance um, is an actor with a plan. As soon as actor says to me, oh I know how to play this scene. I got read the scene. I know, I know how to do this. As soon as I hear that I know I'm in trouble because it's a plan because we never in life plan how to play a scene. We as, the, as a character I as a character, you as a character going into a moment, as a person going into a moment, we have an idea of what we want to do. 
but we don't have a plan like an actor could have a plan because an actor says, I know how I'm going to play this line, I know how I'm going to do this move and it all becomes mechanical. It may become a, a performance that's brilliant and stunning but it won't feel authentic. It'll feel like a performance. So an actually an authentic quote performance really is not a performance at all. An authentic moment with a character is an authentic moment with a character and directors have to th think that way. And so consequently directors have to stop asking actors to give a certain result. I need more anger, I need more rage, I need more empathy, I need more humility, I need more vulnerability because that's a plan. If the director can think about igniting the character and what the character is trying to do in the situation then the director will get a more authentic performance. It may not be exactly the one he was hoping for or aiming at but it will be authentic. Can you tell us a story of any time you corrected a director on directing an actor and not the character? Oh. Without naming any names. <laughs> Without naming any names. Or projects. Or <clears throat> um, yeah, that's, that's really, I mean there are, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of um, times I've been working with <coughs> directors. Now you got to understand that when I'm working with the director uh, if I'm consulting on a project, not, not on a workshop, workshop is one thing, but actually working on a project there's a whole process that the director and I go through which we call workshopping which we bring actors in to actually do every single scene in the movie. These are not the actors that will be in the movie. And we're doing two or three things simultaneously. We're exploring the characters, we're exploring the staging of the scene, and I'm also working with the director on how he's working, he or she is working with the actors. And this is many times when I run into the result directing. And what I'll do is the director may say to the actor, when doing a scene, the scene's going okay, then that director will say to the actor, okay, let's do it again. And um, she, meaning the character, is more afraid here. She, I need to see more fear. And what I'll do right at that moment, I'll stop because this is a workshop situation, workshopping as a consultant and I'll stop and I'll say to the director, I'm going to do you a big favor right now. Something that will never happen unless I'm here to do it for you. I'm going to ask the actor a question. And he goes, okay. And I say to the actor, what did you just hear and what did you just feel? And the actor will say, oh, well I heard that he wants more anger and rage. I said, how do you feel? And she goes, I'm pissed off and I'm confused. And I say to the director, that's what you're going to get. Is that what you want? He goes, uh, well, no. And then I explain, see what the pissed off and confused is that you've bypassed her process. You've told her, just give me a result, figure out how to get there. Rather than going back and talking to the character, rather than saying she is more angry or she is more enraged at this moment, go back to the character and build within the character the reason for the rage. Build the rage and then just send her into the scene. So this is the diff big difference between directing the actor is giving a result and, and actually telling the actor uh, what you want, telling the actor the, the results you want and even <coughs> telling the actor what you want them to do on certain lines do this on this line and the difference between that and actually talking to the character and igniting the character in a different way and then send them into the scene and chances are you'll get exactly what you want. How, how do you mean though? What, how do you do that? How would you build rage if you're talking to the character through the actor? What, what might you say? Okay, let, let's say it's a scene between boyfriend and girlfriend uh -huh. which this one was and uh, basically you know it's with this scene, um, we, and we all know this because we read the scene, it's going to end up in a rape at the end of the scene, a date rape. Okay. Okay. And she um, is very angry with him because he's being very inappropriate with her and he's being overly aggressive. So, and this is where the director said he wanted more anger and he's thinking appropriately, like, I need that anger to get him angry enough to stimulate the rape. Okay. But the thing is why is she angry? To, be, to begin with. Now I could just say to her, I need more anger out of her. Of her. Mm -hmm. But I can go back to the character, her name is Susan, I, and I could say, and I go back to, to Susan. I said, Susan, why are you on this date now? 
And she'll answer the question, why am I there? I said, do you really want to be with him? And she said, I don't. And I can start to question what's going on inside the character at that moment, why she's resenting him, why she doesn't want to be on the date, why this is bringing up some kind of fears and discomfort within her. And I'm just, I'm just building that. Actually, what's going on in the character at that moment, I'm just igniting that. And I say, okay, let's do the scene again. And now she goes into the scene with all these feelings genuinely inside her, not manufactured. They're genuinely in there. And she goes in the scene and you'll get it. You'll get what you want. In other words, it's, I know what the result is I want. What's going to cause that within the character for that to happen? I have to ignite that. I don't have to ask for the result. I have to ignite what causes the result. The cause, not the effect. Okay. So you're egging Susan on. You're saying you're, you're actually giving examples, saying he's 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 being too rough with you. He's being disrespectful. You're you're almost throwing out yeah. things. Yes and no, Karen. I'm not egging her on. I would never do that because it's all this is all done with questions. That's why it's called interrogation. I would say, how do you feel about him right now? I feel fine. Well, why are you with him? I, I don't. Do you want to be with him? No. I said, then why don't you leave? Now I'm still asking her question, and I'm forcing her to question herself. Do, do you know? What I mean? Rather than me, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not um, attaching something to her. I'm stimulating something from within her, and I start to, and I can stimulate the emotions that come on with whatever this discomfort is, or this, this, um, these feelings that she's having inside. And now what's happening is the actress. We'll just call her Joan. The actress Joan is gone. Susan is so ignited because I'm just interrogating Susan, interrogating Susan, and she's so ignited. I said, go into the scene. Joan, the actress, is, is basically, and this is what a lot of the actors say when they work this way, it goes, I'm just going to watch and see what Susan does. <laughs> she, they have no control. They have no control over the character. The tar character totally takes control. So that's, that's the difference, you know, in working with actors, and this is the problem. This is what I deal with all the time when I'm consulting. I'm dealing with it when I'm teaching directors how to work. This is what Michael saw at the at the DGA. You remember all that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What does the director say to an actor after he yells "cut"? Okay, I'll tell you what I think they should say. Uh, but it's a good question because very often, too often, they say nothing to the actor. They'll just They'll go on to talk to the cameraman, they'll talk to sound, all that's appropriate, but somehow the actor is ignored. Or they'll say, okay, fine, fine, we're moving on. My thing is, the first thing you say to an actor after every take, after every, even after every rehearsal, is always say, thank you, very good. Acknowledge the work. My contention is that an actor is always doing the best they can with the information they have. Just acknowledge that. Even if it's not what you want, even if you don't like it, say thank you, very good. Acknowledge the effort. Because the reason for this is a director's, one of the director's primary jobs working with actors, and this is a, not a difficult one to do, but a lot of directors don't do it, is to create a really safe place. A safe place is a, an environment that has literally no criticism. Any director who criticizes an actor for performance is shooting themselves in the foot because as soon as an actor is criticized, they start to shut down inside. And you want their emotional system and their life experience to be available to you and you are going to criticize them. It's not going to happen. They will keep acting and that's what you'll get is acting. You won't get good authentic performances. To create that safe place, one of them, there are many ways, but one of them is constantly acknowledge them and constantly praise them to say thank you. Very good. That's all it has to be. Nothing more than that. And then they will stay open and then they will stay available to you. And then there are a lot of ways, which I can get into another time, is even if you don't like what you're seeing, how you can make an adjustment. One way is the interrogation. I can say, thank you, very good. Start interrogating the characters and send them in again and then the performances will change and I'll get what I want. So um, there's a way to be constructive without criticizing. There's a way to, you say, interrogate yeah. without... Can you give me an example of what a criticism would be on set and how that actor would shut down? Okay, Im imagine you're, you set up a scene, you've rehearsed the scene, you did your first take. Um, let's say it was with the two of you, I'm doing the scene. We did our first take and my reaction was, oh, oh damn. Okay, now that, oh no, that's okay. We, we got to do this again. That didn't work, right? And right then, how do you feel? Horrible, right? Much, yeah. 
I'm like, mm -hmm. ah, I haven't pleased the director. It's not what he wanted. Um, I'm, I'm not a good enough actress. He's probably thinking, wondering why he hired me. All, all of these things. Now that, that was a criticism, not a harsh criticism. I mean, it gets a lot harsher than sure. that. Okay. But that wasn't harsh. But those, those things happen all the time. Or you do the scene, I'm doing a close up on you and you're doing, I say, okay, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I, <clears throat> here's what I mean. You, you got, you know, and then I start to give you more results. I even give you a line reading. And what's gonna happen inside you, you are dying or you're angry, or you're resentful. In other words, I'm now I'm stimulating inside you all the emotions I don't need. I don't need any of those. You know, my job is to stimulate inside you the emotions I do need for you for the character. That's why I say direct the character. So any criticism or adjustment that sounds like it's critical or that the, when the, when the um, director is disappointed in a performance is damaging. It's always damaging. So taking that same scenario and let's suppose it wasn't to your liking, it's not what you need, how would you do it where it was more of an interrogation and it was more sort of positive reinforcement? Okay, let's say you did a take and I didn't like it at all. Okay, we did a close up in you and I'm going, that's not what I want at all. I would say, thank you, thank you. Very, very, very good. Okay, we're gonna go again. And then right at that moment, I'll start interrogating your character and I'll start asking your character questions. And what'll happen, for you, Karen, is your mind, your actor mind will go away. Your actor mind heard, thank you, very good. We're gonna go again. That's what, you know, now, I'm, now the character brain is totally activated. And now you're just totally in the, and you're not thinking about the last take. You're not, I, I can get the last take out of your head. I can get all of that, and I've got you back into the character. I'll make, and through these questions, I can adjust your emotional state of mind within 30 seconds and, and say, okay, roll, let's go again. And now you're going again, and you're going again, you're gonna do the same scene. One thing you do not have in your head, which is good, is how are you gonna do this scene? You have no idea. You just know that now you feel a little more um, resentful. Let's say I did that. You feel more resentful of the, your scene partner, and you're going into the scene. And I say, just go in the scene. And you know what you get to do? Just do the scene the best you can. Do you know what? It'll change. It'll be different. And because there's no plan from you or me, it will be authentic. And you may even come out and you may even afterwards go, wow, that came out different. I go, yeah, it was great. Okay, let's do another one. Yeah, each one will be authentic because the authenticity, the lack of authenticity is because of the plan. You and I can't be authentic even in this moment. If we had a plan, right now we're just in a conversation. That's authentic. What do you say to an individual whose family member is not only discouraging about a creative career, but downright just adamant that that's not the way to go? Um, what would be something you could tell someone who they can't change their family member's mind, they can't change their support system and the structure that's been built around it, but. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I think it also depends where that negativity is coming from. I think sometimes family members, if it's a younger person who wants to become a writer, there's the parent who says, you can't be a writer, you can't be a filmmaker, you'll never make it, you need some fallback position, go to college, become an accountant or something like that. That's growing, I think, out of real fear, real love, but also fear. They want the best for their child and they're protecting them, they feel. And so that's kind of the good reason to do that. But I think deep down, sometimes friends, spouses, family members, even parents sometimes feel resentment towards someone because deep down, they once had a dream to do something and either their parents shut it down or they just got too frightened. So they're working as the Accountant. I don't know why accountant is always the job you pick as the boring job. I'm sure there are accountants who are passionate about it, but they, they made the choice to play it safe. And I think the idea that someone close to them is going to have the courage to break out and do something out of passion uh, that they're committed to is causes resentment and it sort of scares them. So they don't want somebody else to succeed where they failed to have the courage that they didn't. Either way, if you're on the receiving end of that, I think it's very difficult 
I get emails often from people in those situations. I find too, it often happens with spouses, particularly women who want to write and their husbands or male significant others don't honor it. Now, sometimes they aren't as blatant to say, no, you shouldn't do this. They pay lip service to it, but they treat it like a hobby. In other words, I, I do a lot of work and lecture a lot to the romance writers of America, and there are romance writers who are passionate about it, giving everything they can to this. They see it as a career. Some of them are making money at it, but yet it's like their writing is always expected to take sort of third or fourth place after the kids are taken to school and the dishes are done and if the husband wants to go out or if they're going to watch a movie, you know, they have to sort of find secret time to do that and that's very tough. My suggestion to those people is as much as possible disengage from that. Um, uh, recently I got an email from someone and they said, I tell my friends that I want to do this and they all laugh at me and I tell my parents and they discourage me and my answer was stop telling them. Just because the one thing about writing is you can do it by yourself. So just go about your business. Just pursue your dream on your own. Don't tell them you're finishing a script. Find a writer's group. Find classes. Find other places where there are people who love what you love and have your passion. Get support from them. And just go about that on your own. And when you finally get that script optioned, then show them the check. And then they might come around. Even before that, I think at some point you have to find the courage to stand up and say, look, this is not a hobby. This is not a lark. This is my career. I may not be making money at it yet, but this is what I want to do with my life and I need your respect for that. You don't have to do anything, but you have to honor it and let me make that a priority some of the time. That's tough. It comes back to that fear and courage thing, but you're going to have to find that courage because it's a lot less painful than not finding it and 40 years later or 30 years later looking back and saying, gee, I wonder what would have happened if I'd have done what I really wanted to do. And you wrote about a similar situation on your blog, right? Oh, yeah, because I had recently gotten an email like that and there was uh, a, a young man, I don't recall, I, th I, I think he was in college studying something that his parents had wanted him to study and he hated it and he told them as passionately as he could, I really want to write. I want to write and then I want to be a filmmaker. And they like were threatening to disown him and they said, you can't do that. So he told the mark and he thought, I'll do it on my spare time and I'll go ahead and do what they want, which is go to, I think it was law school or pre-law. And he was so miserable that he got an ulcer and he, according to his email, and eventually he started taking drugs. He became an alcoholic, he got on drugs, he had to go into rehab and he almost died. And that finally was the wake up call to him. And he said, I can't, I can't, I literally can't live like this. I'm not going to survive this. Mm -hmm. So that gave him the courage and the support because of the rehab and the, and the program and so on to finally go after the thing he wanted to go after. It's, it's a tough thing. It's a very tough, sad situation. But at the end of the day, you got to do what the hero of a movie has to do. And that is, if you want it bad enough, you got to overcome those deep seated fears and somehow find the courage to step up. So do you get a lot of these emails from, I mean, I mean I, I'm sure you get a lot of emails from people just about their scripts and all that, that whatever, just a consulting. But I'm, I'm curious about how much um, correspondence you get from people who are struggling with challenges beyond just the challenge of writing like this. Not, not too many. I think that they're more memorable because uh, they're painful to me. Mm -hmm. Because if people are emailing me saying, I don't know how to get an agent, it's sort of like the director who goes to the camp. There's, there mm -hmm. is a solution to that that probably will work. There is a process. Mm -hmm. But when you're, when you're trying to help somebody who is up against a real emotional crisis and facing people who really aren't supportive, mm -hmm. it's hard to say, take these three steps and it'll all be taken care of. Yeah. So I think they're more memorable than they are yeah. frequent, yeah. but it's tough to do. I would add too, this may, but it occurs to me that there's another kind of email I seem to have gotten a lot lately. And that is the person that emails and says, I'd like you to look at my script. 
I don't want you to coach me. I don't want any consultation. All I want you to do is read it and send me back one sentence saying, am I wasting my time or not? Ooh. And my answer is, I haven't composed the answer. I think I'm going to put it on my next blog, but it's always some form of, I won't do that. I, it's not my place to decide if you're wasting your time. There's only one person that can answer that, and that's you. Because to me, whatever it is, and this, if you're directing, if you're acting, if you're writing, if you're an accountant, if you're passionate about it, are you getting joy from the process of doing that? It doesn't mean every day is a smile on your face, but it means overall this is what makes me alive. Then you should be doing it. And if you're not, and you're doing those creative things for any other reason than the, in, than the joy it gives you, like mm -hmm. money or success or, you, or rebellion or whatever, mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be doing it. But it has nothing to do with talent and success to right. me. Or, uh, or the quality of that one script. No, no. Yeah, yeah absolutely not. It, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I won't even make that evaluation about a script. I, I would never say this script sucks or this script is great. My job is to say, this is what you've done. Or, or you've done this, my job is to help you make it better. Mm -hmm. And I, I help writers that make million dollars a script make them better, and I help brand new writers make them better. That's all I'm there to do. Mm -hmm. Anything else is their decision about how they want to spend their time. I think along these lines, one thing, because I don't deal with this that much, that's why I was curious, mm -hmm. um, especially in the world of directing, well, first of all, directing is very easy. I mean, writing, you can quite honestly just go off by yourself and write a script. You can't go off by yourself and just make a movie. You know, I mean, it takes a lot of other people and a lot of other um, aspects of it. But getting back to this whole thing of resistance from family or mm -hmm. friends or even from inside, people who, you know, that deal with the old doubts. Oh, sure. And I deal with, you know, with a lot of directors, you know, who say, you think I'm good at, again, you think I'm good enough? Look at my little film, my little short film. I got a little short film. You think, you know, I could make it. The only thing I can ask them, I, which I've done several times, I say, listen, I want you to imagine that you stop directing right now. They go, what? Because they think I'm telling them that they shouldn't. I said, I'm not telling you you shouldn't. I just imagine you stop directing right now. And you never, never do it ever again. Are you okay with that? Because if they say, yeah, I said, well, there's your answer. If they say, no, I can't, you know, and I'm, what I'm looking for is that passion. No, I, this is something I have to do. I have to keep going. And it's that passion that will push you up against all those obstacles, whether it's family, friends, raising money, whatever, if, if there isn't a strong enough passion that this is the thing I must be doing. I can't imagine, I mean, I've talked to directors that I can't imagine doing that. I don't know what I would do. I don't know what other, I said, if you had to get another kind of job, I, call, I, I, I don't know what else I would do. This is the only thing I know how to do and this is the only thing I want to do. I said, okay, good, then we're going to keep doing it. And I think, it's, again, regardless of the quality. Yeah. It's the drive, the internal drive, and it's, and it's that in, internal vo that voice somewhere inside you. Because I know, and I'm guessing that Michael has the same thing, I know that inside my career has been driven by some kind of voice that says, keep doing this. Even though this that I'm doing now is not what I plan to do. I'm, I'm doing less directing and more teaching. But something had said, keep going with that. Something kept driving me, then I realized, how much I enjoy teach, I go, well, that, then I guess this is what I need to be doing. And I think that's what we have to get, and that's a little bit what you're talking about, get in touch with that. If you can get in touch with that and realize that that's part of you, not because I want to make movies and I want to you know, move to Hollywood and I want to do, make a lot of money, because that's not the reason to do this. First thing I was going to say is personal, just when you reach that point where you stop thinking, what should I be doing? and just turn around, for me it was turning around and realize, I love this, mm -hmm. I love this. And I had always long ago thought, well, people would always ask me, well, if you know all this about story and screenplays, why aren't you a screenwriter? And I, there was always a part of me that didn't want to hear that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because deep down I thought, yeah, I should be, and I'm settling. And finally I realized, no, I, I tried it, and it was hard, <laughs> but also it wasn't, it wasn't where I lived. It wasn't my passion. Yeah. This is what I love. I love talking, as you can see. I love talking about story moving. I love helping people with their stories. But I was also going to add, in light of what you said, 
I also think that what Mark is saying about go after the passion and you got to keep doing that, that's ultimately the road to success. That all those other, the, the, the reason you shouldn't be going after it, the, the money and so mm -hmm. on, is more likely to come if you're going after it because it's your passion. I mean, if you listen to interviews with successful people in the film industry, especially the creative, the really creative, the mm -hmm. directors, the writers, the actors. Mm -hmm. I remember <clears throat> I saw Paul Newman interviewed eons ago, and he said, you know, when I came along, there were better actors, there were better looking guys, but nobody was as tenacious as I was. I just wanted it more. And I've seen that again and again with screenwriters. I, people email me or I work with people and they say, oh, I can't get anybody to read my script and I can't get an agent and so on. And they're still, you know, diddling around with the same script they were working on three years ago. And the ones who make it are the ones that just, I write, every day I write, I write and I write and I write and I crank out scripts and they get better and better, but they just keep going after it. If you really are tenacious, you're more likely to succeed than any other quality, including mm -hmm. talent, I think. Mm -hmm. Does screenwriting structure really matter? Is there a concrete? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's great. I would just keep it at that. You wanted me to keep the, You want me to take that question seriously? Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. That yeah. It? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> Screenplay structure really matters. It does matter, yeah. okay. So is there a certain formula that you live by and that you advise other people to follow? That, yes. That what, it's 10 pages mine. in? Mine. Oh, yours, okay, yeah. great. I, Do I don't tell. just advise, I command that they follow my formula and nobody else's. Um, yeah, I'm not really allergic to the, to the word formula as a lot of consultants and other people people who do what I do are sometimes because I just think a formula to me is a prescribed way of doing something to get the same results every time and structure is designed to get the same result every time and that is to maximize the emotional experience of the reader of the script and eventually the audience but of the reader <coughs> and it's it simply just means the sequence of events how do you arrange the sequence of events in the script to keep the audience emotionally involved in the story and the characters. So I have a particular way that I approach structure. It divides story into six basic stages. But Chris Vogler has a way that's built on Joseph Campbell's approach to myth. And John Truby has a way that he's designed that has 22 steps. And Eric Edson has a few more steps in what he calls the story solution. And they all work. They're all good. It's just the door we come in to look at the deeper issue. And that is, are you creating the peaks and valleys of your story in a way that keeps the audience involved, keeps the audience inside those characters and experiencing the movie? But it's absolutely critical. I agree. In terms of directing, same thing. Is there a certain formula that you advise your directors? Or it varies every time? Formula for, formula for directing? You know, hey, there's a Jungian theory, there's Freudian, there's all these different things. So <laughs> everyone has their own take on things. I would, I don't know, but now you got me thinking about it. Maybe there is. Um, there, there is, in a way, I mean, in one of my books, I have what's called the nine basic steps. And I think probably within that, there is sort of a formula. The nine basic steps are nine questions. The first question, which we talked about earlier, is what is the story really all about? And the first, first four, five, six, six questions all have to do with the script. Do you understand the script? Do you understand the story? Do you understand the characters? And this, this is all leading up to directing. So my formula, you know, or approach is like you've got to understand script and story so deeply. This is long before you and understand characters deeply. This is long before you start working with actors. Because too many directors will read a script and say, okay, let's get some actors in here and start working. And they not only don't understand the script and the characters, they haven't really f f sat down and, and done the work they need to do on the script to understand how it works or the need, getting back to the collaboration that they should do, the work they should do with the writer. Um, in other words, going back to the writer and asking the writer, I think one of the most important questions you can ask a writer, you've read the script, who was it? It was, um, I think it was Harold Clerman said, you know, always start out with praise. Great script, great story. You know, just keep everybody happy and start with enthusiasm. That's what he said. But to ask the writer, 
Okay, what compelled you to write this? Which very few directors ask. Directors would come in with a script and say, okay, here's a problem, we got an act to, you know, and they start attacking the script. I say, don't attack the script, talk about the story. In fact, don't even talk about the story. Talk about the impulse for the story. And sometimes when you, I mean, I had a script that I was working on that I was going to direct, which was a really harsh, brutal script about tough love and deaths and killing. And I said to the writer, why? What compelled you to write this? He says, well, I read about a case about a young man who was accused of killing a woman. And he said, well, I didn't murder her. It was tough love. It was out of love that she died. And he was convicted of murdering her because actually he did kill her. But the writer said, how could that happen? How could a young man get to the point in a relationship that thinks that in a moment of passion and love and his partner dies that he didn't really kill her? And he wrote a, he wrote a script exploring that question. I went, wow, that's great. Now, and it was a great script. But then at that point I said, okay, now I understand where the writer's coming from. So in terms of a formula, get back to the script, get back to the story, get back to the writer and understand where they're coming from. Then move deeper into it. So by the time you're bringing in the actors, now um, you understand the material really well and we, nothing we could talk about and the writer's still there. That's the other thing we can talk about. But my sort of formula says, the last, one of the last things you do in making this film is bring out a camera. I have these nine steps. The first seven, we haven't even talked about cameras yet. And they said, well, I'm a filmmaker. I said, I know. But unless you understand the story, understand the script, you know how to work with actors, you know how to create performances, authentic performances, you know how to stage a scene, you know how to see, get a scene up on its feet in a three-dimensional environment, not on, sta not on stage, in a room or whatever, and make it work authentically, then, maybe then, you can start thinking about a camera. So that my, these nine steps take you on a sequence through it to keep you honest and to keep you focused on the story, not on filmmaking. And this is a problem in a lot of film schools where I teach all over the world is the first thing they do is they give them cameras. I say, don't, don't give them a camera. And when I teach like in Munich, I teach a film school in Munich and I go in and I said, okay, the first thing we're going to do is do you know how to tell a story? And they all have their little scripts. I have a script. I said, yeah, tell me a story. Just tell me a story. Can you even tell a joke? If you can tell a joke, well, we're off to a good start. And I can say, are you a storyteller? You're going to be a filmmaker. You should be a storyteller. So it's all about what comes first. And again, it's sort of like we were talking about, you know, the passion for filmmaking and I want to make films and I want to be a star and I want to make, meet, meet all these famous people. You know, that's the wrong reason to make films. <clears throat> Another wrong reason is make films is I want to play with cameras and I want to do editing. That's in fact, cameras and editing, all the technology stuff is just tools that we use in a delivery system. If the event we've created, the scene or the whole story, is not interesting, then it's not worth filming. So all of that has to come first. So there is, a, so I do have sort of a, a sequence. It's not really a formula, it's more of a sequence. One of the things about structure that I found that sort of changed more than anything for me because I didn't realize this for the first 10 or 15 years that I was a consultant and lecturer and that is I always thought of plot structure I meaning it was the sequence of events and the things that happened and that's sort of externally so this need and it is it is a plot structure and there are certain key things that need to happen at 25 percent and 50 percent and 75 but the revelation to me was when I realized that the inner journey the character takes also has a structure and it's exactly the same structure. The same six stages apply to that and when you really get that, um, in fact I've uh, not knowing anything about directing actors but you've heard my lecture about that, I've often thought from an actor's point of view if an actor understood formulaically where characters would be in this arc depending on where in the script it would be it could really inform the performance because they would they would realize if I've just if I'm at the midpoint of this story I'm going to have to make a bigger commitment than I've ever made 
And that's going to be terrifying. But once I do, now I'm going to be moving more steadily into my essence, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that intertwining of that outer journey and inner journey, as I said before, that to me is where it gets both fascinating and, and really helpful to writers, because they can really integrate those two things. In fact, that would be a good, a good seminar, a one-weekend seminar. <laughs> No, the inner journey from the writer's side and from the actor's side. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Doing just sort of putting those two, to, exploring those two together somehow. Yeah. We're going to be doing in the in the weekend. We're already doing. I'm sure that's going to come up because I'm going to be talking about that, and I'll just bring it up Good. because I've always Good. been curious Good. about that, and we'll see if if that is helpful to actors because I don't know, and it might not yeah. be, but. We'll see, does it mesh with the process you use with actors in directing them? And is it helpful for you as a director or for the actors to know, well, this occurs at this point in the script, at this point in the inner journey. So being aware of that helps, or does that lead them more to trying to get the result you were talking well, about? I think it, 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 help, it could help a lot with the actors just to know that. Mm -hmm. Getting back to my way of working with actors, I don't want them to be holding so tenaciously to that, you know, so that the actor brain is just right. o overworking itself. But to know that, say, oh yeah, okay, I know I'm at the midpoint. I know it, this is a crucial thing. I know that. Much more important, I mean, it's great for the actor, for the director yeah. to know that. So the director, if the director is interrogating the character, the director is leading the character to that level of intensity or, or focus. And the actor knows that we're going that way. But, yeah. the, but I th it still has to be the, the combination between the director, not just the actor on their own. Right. Well, because a character in a movie wouldn't know it. No. <laughs> no, but a character, <laughs> but, but the director can <clears throat> increase or decrease an intensity or a focus of right. that moment That's what I say, to, that to match to, to say, because I know where we are in the story. Exactly. Yes. I agree, I'm agreeing completely because yeah. the director could have that in mind and it would be helpful. But yeah. if you're trying to reach the character, and and the character said, "Well, I just crossed the point of no return." That's the actor talking. That's the actor talking. Cause, yes, because yeah. in real life, we don't know how afraid we are. It's all yeah. subconscious, unconscious. We don't know when yeah. we're up against it as much as we are. We yeah. don't know that it's going to have a happy yeah. ending. We usually think otherwise, even though if it's a Hollywood yeah. movie, it usually does. So we've just had a question come in via Twitter from Levi K. Dean. And Levi writes, for me, in terms of screenwriting, how do I script a great scene? What elements and or components are needed, so to speak? And then he adds for Mark, is there anything you can add in terms of a director bringing a great scene to life? So Michael, we'll start with you. Okay, I, I guess the best thing I can do is I can give some suggestions on how to improve a scene that you're working on. The first thing, before you even start writing the words of the scene, you want to step back and, as usual, my, my advice is ask questions. In other words, first of all, you should have already asked the questions, who is my hero? What is the hero's wound? What are they afraid of? What is their visible goal uh, that they're going after? And where structurally does the scene occur? Because it, depending on how far along in that inner journey the character is, that's going to affect how they would react in the situation. After you've figured those things out, then the next question you want to ask is, what does my character want in this scene? And does that desire, is that desire going to, or do they think it's going to move them closer to their goal, or at least overcome an obstacle to achieving their goal? If the answer to that question is no, then the scene should be jettisoned. It's not serving the story because every scene has to move the character closer to their visible goal or force them to face an obstacle or anticipate an obstacle that they didn't know they were going to previously. So let's say the answer is yes, though you do know that this is going to contribute to the goal and you figure out what do they want to accomplish within the scene. What do they, where do they want to be or what do they want to have happen to the end of the scene? Then, what are they going to do to try and do that? That will constitute the action of the scene. 
the dialogue you just set aside until all these other things are figured out because the dialogue is only really to reveal in some way how they're feeling about the situation or it's dialogue where they're trying to persuade somebody to do something or get above somebody else, take control of a situation and so on. But first you want to see what does the character want in the scene and then what is the obstacle they must face in the scene to achieving that. Because the emotion of a movie and the emotion of any scene is primarily going to grow out of the conflict. If it's not the conflict being faced right then, it's the conflict that they are anticipating or occasionally that the audience is anticipating. In a thriller, we may know that the killer's in the next room and all the hero wants to do is get to the kitchen to make a sandwich, but it's still, it's still about what do they want and what are we anticipating is going to get in their way. And then when it comes to dialogue, especially if you struggle with dialogue, get, get something down. You should get anything down to begin with just so you've got a scene to work with rather than a blank page. But if you don't know what the dialogue should be, write dialogue where the character is just saying how they feel and what they want. It's what's known as on-the-nose dialogue. It's terrible dialogue, but at least now you've got a scene. You've got action, you've got character, you've got dialogue, and now you can ask the last question that would be my suggestion, and that is, okay, now I know what they want. They're going through this action. How can I make it more difficult for them, first of all, but also instead of having them announce their feelings or desires, can they do it without saying anything or if they in a conversation how can they hide their true desires or feelings and cover it up with more surface superficial subtextual language and that's sort of what you're going for and those are sort of the beats of going through it then it's a matter of just going through that process again and again and again with each successive draft but that'll, that'll get you to something if you're looking at a blank page to begin with. So it's good, Michael. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. Oh, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> what was the other, the other half? Sure, Levi writes, Mark, is there anything you can add in terms of a director bringing a great scene to life? Okay, I mean, first of all, everything Michael's saying is, as far as I can, is right on. Um, in terms of creating that scene and all the, which I appreciate, I do appreciate all the, all the elements about, about the objectives and about the obstacles and about the subject, all of that um, is necessary for a good scene. Now, my job as a director, a director's job, now to bring it to life, first of all, we're bringing in actors, which was only going to make it more complex and confusing. But the, <clears throat> the first thing, sort of going back a little bit, what Michael's saying is for the director to look at this scene now, and it's just assuming the writer's not there or whatever, just looking at the scene, and starting to understand a lot about the scene in terms of what Michael was just talking about. In other words, Okay, I have these, this scene, these two or three characters. What, do, what does each character want? Do I know what each character wants? Do I know what the obstacles are? Do I know what's in the way of him or her achieving what do they want in the scene? Do they achieve what they want in the scene? Do they think they have achieved it and maybe they haven't? Have they achieved it and maybe they don't realize they have? In other words, <coughs> uh, what even the looking at the character, do they have an idea of how the character thought he might go about trying to achieve what he wants? In other words, what was his intention? How, you know, what was his plan? Did he have a plan? Is he going on? Just all of these things that are going on inside the character. Then going down deeper in, into the scene again with it before working with actors, subtextually what is going on between these characters, what go, is going on in every single scene, every single moment, there is a deep rich subtext of what the characters are not saying, some of the dialogue you talked about that is that horrible dialogue on the nose, well that's not being said. Okay, now I'm looking at the scene, it's not there, the writer didn't give me that. Do I know, can I feel, can I sense, do I have any idea of what's really going on inside these characters? A lot of what I talk about is every character in every scene has two objectives. I mean, they have way more than two, but there are two main. One objective is the, the objective the character would state. This is what I want. I want to convince her that we should go on this vacation. That's the scene. Great. What's really going on? Now there's a private objective. What am I really doing? What's really driving me? Is it my control over her or my, or my dominance of you know what 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 is the really deeper objective am i trying to prove her to her that i'm 
a good leader. I, I don't know, whatever it is, which is not written in the scene. Can I sense that for every single character in the scene? Then <clears throat> there's another part of the scene, this again before um, working with the actors. To me, every scene has, every, I don't care how small the scene is, every scene has what I call a core moment. There's a moment in the scene. There's a little moment. It usually comes, this is all very, almost very similar to your structure for the whole story. Mm -hmm. It usually comes about almost at the end of the scene, <laughs> three quarters, a little bit. Mm -hmm. the end. There's a moment. And sometimes it's the briefest moment. It could be a recognition, it could be a line, it could be some, somebody, which is really the primary reason why this scene is in the movie. Now, the characters have to go through this whole scene and pursue these objectives and up against these obstacles and then they're going to hit this core moment where either, let's we'll just take, say there are two characters. The characters realize something, understand something, hear something, sense something. There's a shift, there's a slight change. This is part of the arc and the transformation of the character. Or I, the audience, sense something, see something. Something is going to shift in me that I realize that is about the character that the character always knew and now it's revealed or it's revealed from one character to another. In other words, there's something that by the end of this scene, everything has changed and it could happen in a brief moment, a real brief moment. So, you know, so I work with directors. I said, identify what that core moment is, what you think that is. Because I say as you're directing it, you're aiming for that. You're aiming for that moment to happen between the characters and between the characters and the audience. Then you bring in the actors. Now we're bringing in the actors. Now we're adding the elements of how to direct the scene. Then you go back to, like we were talking about earlier, building the character. <laughs> interrogating the character, igniting the character, and then to make the scene work, how to just think about one thing. I have this character, this man, he's going to go in, he's going to try to convince his wife to what, go on a vacation or something simple like that. What state of mind, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, whatever, do I want to send this character into the scene? How does he start? And what is his intention, his objective at the beginning? Actually, forget for the moment how the scene turns out. Forget it because the character doesn't know how the scene's going to turn out. So you got, if you want an authentic character, you've got to figure out how to send him in and allow the character, as we're rehearsing, allow the character ignited in a certain way to go in and literally not play the scene, but run into the scene and be surprised by what he says and what the other person says. Not be planned. I say this, you say that, I say that's the planned scene. An authentic scene is I'm, surpri I'm surprised by what you said, I'm even surprised by what I said. In other words, that's, that's the authenticity and still I'm designing it to hit that core moment. A couple things I wanted to add listening to what Mark said. One is uh, I was talking about characters, what does the character want? That's if the, there was only one character in the scene. I think what you always want to look for as a writer is if you've got two or more characters in the scene, you want to create a situation where they want opposing things or, an, or because otherwise there's no conflict. Or one way to look at it is every scene is a power grab. Everybody wants to take control of the situation in whatever way that means to them. And so how are they sort of secretly jockeying for position, you know, like he and I do. Like which of us, we're all just worried, we're worried about which of us looks smarter. See, that's what this whole interview has been. The other thing um, that you said about the, the, uh, the desires on the part of the character, I was thinking, I know you said there's a lot more than two, but two more I would think about as the writer um, besides, what were the two you said? What does the character well, well, no, no, the the, the two different objectives. Yeah. The two. Well, basically what I broke down, Michael, is what I call the public objective. Right. In other words, if I ask, in fact, anybody in this room now, what, what, what are you doing here? What do you want? What's your objective right now? And we could talk about what we're doing this interview. That's our public objective. Then there's underneath that, deep underneath that, is a private objective, which may not even be recognized. Well, I, yeah, that's what I was... It may be in the unconscious. What's driving that character to try to do that? Right. And one way I would look at it, it's not quite the same as a desire, is to ask what is the character hiding 
from the other person consciously? What is she hiding from him and what is she hiding from herself? Mm. What's the thing that she's not yet aware of that is really driving her and you know underneath especially in the first half or three-fourths of the movie towards the end you'd hope that all that would come to the surface but uh, deception and secrecy are very very powerful in telling a story because they add a, a whole new layer of conflict they get into this inner journey stuff and they'll and the more conflict on the more layers the more you're going to pull in your audience that's good I like the hiding thing the hiding. Yeah. See, because I was into that, yeah, the subconscious or the unconscious or the you know unaware right. of, but the hiding and deception and secrecy—that's good. I'm going to steal that. Can I steal that? Oh sure, okay. it's yours. Thank you. No, I'll, you can still use it. Oh. I mean, I'm not taking it forever. <laughs> oh, okay, You're, you want to share it? You don't want to steal it? No, I'm not going to steal. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to. As long as we're clear that my agenda you, is to I'll, look better, I'll give you credit for it. Okay, good. Okay, because we know my stated objective is to look smarter. I think we yes, and, I, and I'm trying and I'm trying to help you with that. I appreciate that. I'll help you think you're winning. Thank you. Let's move on. That was great. Let's move on. <laughs> so we have a Paul Newman quote here, which reads, "Don't judge my work by the rules that were easy, where I didn't have to stretch and explore and expand. Judge my work by the rules that challenged me physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Those are the rules where one false step could bring down the whole house of cards." So what advice do you have for directors who have to work with actors who are taking on one of those challenging roles? Hmm. Well, I, I would say the first thing is if the director can recognize that it is that challenging to begin with, that it is going to stretch this actor a lot. I mean, this director has cast this actor in this role, obviously and that it's going to be a big stretch and it's going to push them maybe to their limits and all of that. Um, <clears throat> then the next best thing you can do is again create that safe place for them. They, they need a really safe environment with, within which they can stretch and explore and expand um, into, into this role. And then <clears throat> I think that the best thing the director can do is, is really be a massive support system to, by your support system, I mean allowing the actor to really um, fall deeply into that character, knowing that the director is always there to rescue them, save them, be a safety net, pull them out, not criticize them, so that they can go into those, um, whatever, whatever the extreme areas are. And then one other thing about this, because when I heard Paul Newman when he said this at Yale when I was there, he said it differently. I just realized when I heard, heard it again. Because he was talking about a lot about um, the roles, the scripts that were not well written and that were really challenging because there wasn't enough to hold on to. And this may have been what he meant here with the whole house of cards is going to fall down if you don't pull it off. Now from a director's side, a director's also got to recognize if that's the challenge we have here. If that's the challenge we have to that we have a script that's not that strong, it's not that cohesive, and we're, we're running a risk, like we are when we make almost any film, that this film just really is not going to work. And what I suggest there is that what, they've, what has been done on a lot of films, I have a quote for you, since you have a quote. James Brooks, James L. Brooks, who did As Good As It Gets, and uh, a lot of other great films. But, and one, uh, uh, some panel he was talking on and I was there he said that his um, fear making a film was knowing that there's a really good chance I'm going to make a really bad film and his goal was to just not make a bad film. He's not trying to make a great film, he's trying to not make a bad film because he's very much aware of how delicate this whole process is and how easily it could fall apart. And when they were making um, As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson, it was about a week into the production that, um, and this is on the DVD, they talk about it, he and Jack talk about this, that they realized they didn't know, they weren't clear on how to do Melvin's character, this you know, misogynistic, cruel, racist human being that we have to fall in love with eventually. We have to believe that he can fall in love with someone else eventually. And it's, it's a love story and we have to believe at the end that Helen Hunt has fallen in love with him. And Jack Nicholson and um, 
James Brooks, who was one of the writers on it, had no idea quite how to pull this off. They realized they were in deep trouble. So their decision was they shot a huge range of performances on every scene with Jack Nicholson. A huge range from being very gentle to being really brutal. In other words, the level of brutality and callousness and charm and humor, all of those were played within every scene, a wide range. And they said, we'll figure it out in post-production. We'll make the choices in post-production. And that's another way that a director can work with an actor, say, giving an actor that leeway. Say, listen, I'm, you're in exploring a whole new territory here. I'm going to allow you to explore on camera. And then in post-production, we'll, we'll make the choices so you don't have to feel like you have to hit it right because you don't know what right is and neither do I. And if the director can admit that and allow the actor to do that, then the actor has more latitude to work with and more likely to give a strong performance. Let's suppose an actor has a very emotional scene and maybe they're running behind on set and it's incredibly excruciating for the actor to be in the moment to prepare to then perform it and then they yell cut and then great let's try it again. Is that something that's advisable or give the actor more time to regroup? You know, you, you talk about a difficult yeah. scene and, and in terms of, of preserving the actor's sanity and preserving the actor's energy for the whole scene. So you tell, this is a very highly emotional scene and when you said time is running out and, and things like that. So there are other there are external pressures besides sure. just the scene. Weather's bad, yeah, all the these different weather's things. Weather's bad and, we, and, and the producer's looking at his watch. Pretty much. One of the worst things you want to see. Um, there were two things and this gets into a little bit of a technical stuff here. You say okay you would do a take and then you say cut and then you say okay give the actor a moment to regroup. Sometimes that moment to regroup will be the worst thing you could do at that moment. Sometimes the worst thing. Depends on the scene. I'm just we're going on a hypothetical sure. scene here. Many times if it's, it's say it's a scene and it's very painful and there's a lot of screaming and yelling and whatever is going on emotionally with the actor. Sometimes the best thing to do is what I do when I'm shooting <coughs> uh, which I call looping, which has nothing to do with ADR looping. It has to looping while we're shooting is the camera doesn't stop. We finish the scene, I go again. And we, depending on what it takes to set up, if, if there have been camera moves and all that, it might take a while to get back to the first position. But if, let's say there's no camera move, let's say it's a close up, and they finish up, say again, and just go again and do it again and do it again. Many times I will, if there's a portion of that scene which is, a, let's say there's a short speech in them. I may isolate that speech as a pickup and have him do that speech and do it again. Now what's happening while he does it again and again, two things will happen. I will talk to him or have the other actor talk to him off camera and I can tell you how that works which is, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. I can have the actor off camera not giving him the lines from the script except as a cue. The actor off camera is throwing subtext at him. Okay? to actually help stimulate whatever is going on inside the actor. I may be talking to him off camera, okay? And he will go through it again, maybe three, four times. That, maybe that's one, that one paragraph, that one scene, that one moment. What happens is the actor goes deeper and because you were not stopping, he will go deeper and deeper and deeper into the scene. Every time he stops, his, the actor part of him will, will have a tendency to pull him out pull him out of that scene. I want him to go deeper into it. Okay? Now this is the type of thing I wouldn't throw at an actor first time, you know, when the, the sun's going down, so this is what we're going to do. These are the kind of things I do in a rehearsal. When I'm rehearsing with the actors, I show them how we may have to do this at some time. So they, they're prepared for it. They're prepared for that process. But that again is another way of getting them totally out of the actor's head and they're totally into the character. Everything they're hearing is about the character. They're hearing subtext from another character which is, can be devastating. They're hearing me interrogate the character which can be devastating and I'll just send them deeper and deeper and deeper in but I'll always be there to pull them out at the end. And we can go very fast before the sun goes down. Earlier today you mentioned that you see tenacity as being one of the number one things that's driven people ahead in this business aside from talent or just, you know, connections, whatever. Tenacity is the number one thing. Of the people the two of you have known, how many years would you say it's taken 
these individuals to have a quote Hollywood career? Ooh. I would rather not answer that. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Sure. Because I don't see any benefit to anybody hearing the answer. Because if I say it's quick, in the hopes that they'll be encouraged it won't take long, and they're taking longer than that, they could get discouraged and quit. If I say it's a long time and they're just starting, they could get discouraged and quit. So I'd rather just say it happens when it happens. But maybe Mark is willing to. Well, your question was, how long have we seen it take? Yes. You know, it's, there's, there's a variety, there's a wide variety, it's a wide variety. And, it's, um, and I think getting back to Michael's thing about tenacity, tenacity is important, whether it takes you 10 years to get a script made. I mean, Dallas Buyers Club took 20 years before they got it made. So there's tenacity for the producers and all that. They had the script a long time before that. And some things happen quickly, happen within a year or something like that. But I think you know, the, the important thing is how much do you believe in what you're doing? Uh, and if you believe, I mean, I have some projects I'm working on and I go, I don't care how long it takes. I just want to get it done. You know, in other words, if you believe in something, if you believe in the project that you're doing, that's, that's what's going to make that time period not matter. Do, do you know anybody say, oh, I've been working on this for two years, three years, five years. I mean, I hear people say, oh, I've been working on the script for eight years. I say, great. I've been working on it for one year. Great. I don't care how long they've been working on it. I, I'm much more interested in their why they want to make this movie, why they've written this script, why, what's, what's driving them to get this particular film made, or even in my case with directors, why, why, what's driving you to <coughs> get this one actor involved you know, because you can't make it without him? Fine. You know, in other words, that's what I'm much more interested in. I don't care how long. I think a time frame, if you get into time frames, it, time frames are good for the newspapers. You know how long this took, and you know how quickly this happened, and there's always the instant stardom, which is never instant. You know, if you really know the story, and then there's you know the long range, you know, fighting for how many twenty years to get a movie made. That's good for the newspapers. It's not helpful. I agree with Michael to the artists at all. It also depends. There's a difference between saying I've been working on this project for twelve years and saying I've only been working on this project for twelve years. I mean, Dallas Buyers Club may have taken that long, but Matthew McConaughey didn't stop acting and the producers didn't stop doing. So I think that's a pitfall when you say, I'm going to just keep hammering and hammering and hammering at this one script and one script and not move on to others. Just get it done and to, to some level and either, but be ready to move on. I, I think a goal should be two scripts a year, certainly. Uh, especially if you're trying to launch your career in the early days, don't get, don't make one idea so precious that you're just going to keep reworking it, reworking it, or keep getting stuck and blocked and not wanting to do anything because you've put all your eggs in that basket. And I think another important thing too, because the way you phrased your question was how, the way I heard it was, how long have you seen it take for someone to make it? And I think. That's not quite the way I would suggest looking at it is because then it becomes what's the definition of making it? Have you made it when you finished your first script and you had that experience? Or have you made it when you got a, an agent? Is it the first dollar you make? But what if you option it for a dollar? Have you made it? I think a better choice for a writer or anyone I think in the industry is to make your goal specific and just say, what is the next step I need to get to that feels just out of reach right now? And so just say, I'm, my focus right now is to finish my screenplay. And don't be thinking about uh, how long is it going to be before I'm a success. That's just amorphous and elusive. Just say, my goal right now is to finish this script. And apply yourself to that. And when that's done, then say, my goal now is to finish the second script and to pursue an agent with this first one and make the goals more finite and specific and shorter as you sort of go up the rungs of that ladder. Yeah, I, th I think you also have to look at, because what you said, Karen, I'm going to quote you, Hollywood success. Didn't you say that? I forget that because that doesn't mean, I mean, it's, I think that's unfortunate. Finishing a script is a success. 
I want to write this story. I finished it. There's the whole story. Forget the quality. That, in other words, how you label success. Okay, that was successful. Now, if you go with what Mike, Michael's saying, two scripts a year, right? Mm -hmm. By the, the end of the year, I've got two scripts up. Wow, two successes. In other words, that is success. Also, looking at, um, from a directing point of view, but also writing, okay, here's what I want to do. I want to direct a feature film, a big feature film. Great. Um, how are you going to do that? I don't know. What are you doing meanwhile? What could you, getting back to what, what is manageable and just only just a little bit. I'm going to do this little short film. I've got a five minute film. Great. Let's do that while you're pursuing the bigger thing. Why? Knowing that and believing that everything I do, every script I write, every little film I make, every little project I do, I get some, someone wants me to direct a commercial for the internet, do that. Everything I'm, is going to take me closer to where I want to be because I'm going to learn from every single experience, something. It may be, I may make a short film and it may be a disaster. I mean, I know the last short film I made, I want to look at it and I go, oh, I made so many mistakes in that. But that's the learning process. In other words, keep working, keep writing, keep writing scripts. And knowing that every script you write, it's going to make you a better writer. Every film you make is going to make it make you a better filmmaker. Even if you say, I'm just going to take out my little camera, like this little cannon we're shooting, on. I'm going to go out. Oh, I have to tell you a story. I was teaching once, it's the same story. I was going to teach you once in England and I was teaching um, at this big film school and there are all these, some famous directors there and te television directors, but also some people who are just starting out. And I was at a film school, so there are film students there too. And there was also this young boy who was 12 years old taking this weekend workshop. I noticed this little boy sitting there and it was fine, I didn't care, I was teaching. And at one point he came up to me and he asked me a question about filmmaking. I forget what the question, he asked me something about directing. And I said, okay, and he says, yeah, he says, I'm going to make a film this weekend, next weekend. I said, really? He says, yeah, I'm going to shoot the film next, I said, you're going to shoot the whole film next week? He says, yeah, yeah, he says, it's only um, a 10 minute film. I said, I, I see. And you have the budget for it? I mean, I said, he says, yeah, yeah, and he had, I think, 10 pounds or something, mm -hmm. the cost of the roll of film, of tape, that would run 10 minutes. And he had the whole film figured out how he's going to do it in one take mm -hmm. and go out in the weekend and shoot one movie and it would be done. And I remember after a little later this summer, I announced to everybody that there's a filmmaker in the, in the room that's going to make a film next weekend and it'll, he'll be done next weekend and he has the budget. People went, really? What? So I introduced him, but it sort of set the bar high for everybody. This kid's going out and he's doing it. He had come to take the seminar and then he's going to go out and make a movie. And he figured out a 10 minute story, it's going to be one take and he'll be done. He'll learn so much from that. In other words, if you're going to be, and this is a lot of what Michael's saying, if you want to be doing it, be doing it. That is success. If you get up, I have for me a, uh, a limit, a, a minimum of number of words I have to write every day. And I know, and my computer, bless its little heart, tells me how many words I've written and I feel very happy when I hit that. That's success. Whether the writing was good or not doesn't matter. It's, so I think we have to, you know, just keep going. Just keep moving. So don't look at it as a final destination, no. but it's little little pinpoints on a map. Yeah. You and, went here, great. And most Hollywood success, as you know, is a fluke. I mean, most films that are made don't, we never see. Most of them are, are terrible. They're, every once in a while, a good one comes out. But it's a fluke, but Hollywood success is a fluke. I mean, there is a lot of good luck, a lot of good fortune, but everybody, every successful director has been working really, really hard, right? So just measure success in small little bite size rather than you know an academy award or some crap like that michael you've mentioned that people's initial inclination is to share their script idea with family and friends and you say they do it too soon and they could be sabotaging themselves why is yeah that? uh my belief is you got to be careful about showing your not so much your script, but sharing your story idea too soon with anybody. I, I sort of liken it to giving birth. I think there's a fetal stage of a creation of any kind, including a story. And the danger is you come up with an idea and the next day you're saying, oh, I had this great idea for a movie. And you haven't worked on it. You haven't been with it. You haven't 
explored its potential, and then whoever you say that to might say, I don't get that, and then you know, you, you jettison it, you get rid of it because you don't think it's good. And I think it's too easy to crush those kinds of ideas if you expose them too soon. The family member issue is slightly different. I think if you have supportive family members, you should always let them read your work so you can hear some really nice things about your writing. Just don't take it to heart. <laughs> I mean, feel good about it, but don't regard that as a basis for concluding it's ready to submit. If you have family members or friends like we talked about earlier, which aren't really supportive, then yeah, don't, don't show it to them. Tell them they can come to the premiere. And before that, it's just, it's just yours. But be careful about who you show it to. And just one thing I said, I'd be succinct with this, but I have to add one more thing about having it read. Be absolutely sure you, ha you get feedback on your script before you send it out to anybody who makes a difference professionally. Don't ever trust your own judgment about whether your script is ready to show. Because I guarantee it's not, even though you think it is, because you're so desperate and so badly want it to be great and so champing at the bit to get reaction, you may send it out too soon to somebody who is then not going to want to read the rewrite because they've already read the mediocre first or second draft. So you've got to go to consultants like me or writers group members or classmates in writing classes or at least friends who will be honest and know something about fi film and storytelling and get their reactions before you conclude that it's ready to go. And only when you consistently get the reaction that I think this is good to go should you go out with it. What do you say to those screenwriters that have their peers or their family read it but they're really just paying lip service to being supportive. How do you know that that's, you know, you say that there's a fine line. Show it, show it to those who, whom you believe are supportive, but don't show it to the ones that are gonna be negative. Well, how does someone know that they're really in one camp versus another? Oh, you can tell. I think, I think almost everybody's gonna know fairly quickly who's supporting you in your dream and who's deep down either resentful of it or trying to steer you away from it or laughing at it. And if you don't, this will be the place you learn because if you it, because it'll depend how they react if they just say this is laughable and say these things that sort of crush your spirit i wouldn't show it to that person anymore but i was saying if you if you want to show it to your mom because your mom thinks everything you do is wonderful fine let her say this is wonderful because that feels great and you need that just don't use that don't then take it to a top director and say my mom loves it i think it's ready for you to look at it does that make sense? You see the distinction It does, there? Yeah. yeah. What about someone that's a serial idealist, and that's probably the wrong terminology, but they come up with these great ideas and then they never do anything. An ideist. <laughs> serial means. idealist, which is the, it's the wrong Gosh. terminology. I'll, uh, uh, let's call it something else. Somebody who's just... Great at coming up with ideas, but they aren't or don't want to be a screenwriter. Well, they never finish them. They abandon them. So they come up with, I have this idea for this guy and he's going to do this and that. Great, and he starts working on it or she works on it and then they tire of it, move on to the next one. And they, their whole supposed career is a succession of these abandoned... Well, there is, there is no career. I mean, they, have, they don't finish them? Well, yeah. they might finish so the, something. But. Okay, so but... Well, that's, that's the definition of block. That's writer's block, or it's a form of writer's block. It just means I never want to finish it because my, my suspicion would be that deep down there's a, there's a real fear that either it's not going to be good enough or I don't want it to be judged or there's a really unconscious fear that if it is good enough I might actually be able to get something going and I would be a success or I would have to be a Hollywood writer or I would have to move to LA or whatever and that it doesn't seem like it it sounds like a dream but deep down it's terrifying because we are very very afraid of change generally. So if you're in that situation as a writer and you find yourself finishing and then going to the next and going to the next and going to the next, I really think somehow possibly with help, with some guidance or counseling or therapy or whatever, you need to take a look at what's really going on here. Why are you, wh what are you feeling like right before you decide to move on to the next one? and try your best to confront that feel, that those feelings, because they're going to get you to a fear. And I think if you can figure out for yourself or with help 
what is the real fear here, then you have a chance of moving past that or, or getting through it. It's like I say about heroes of movies. I say, heroes of movies stop asking themselves, how do I not be afraid and start asking, am I willing to be afraid? because it's a scary prospect. What we've been talking about here sort of cavalierly for the last while, these are scary things. And I think we both really appreciate how frightening it is and how hard it is to write and act and direct. And you need support and you need help for that, but you've got to sort of surrender to it too and say, of course I'm afraid, but I love doing it and I'm willing to be afraid and go forward. And if you can't solve that problem yourself, then I think get some help with that. No, I think, I think that's good. Mark, using your method, during the casting process, how does a director know they're getting the best actor for the role? Okay, there's a, there's, it's a good question. The, um, it's gonna sound like a strange answer. The first thing is, because you said the best actor for the role. I would say don't focus on the best actor for the role. Focus on the best character. In other words, I can, and I'll tell you how the method, my technique works. When I have an actor come in and audition, <clears throat> they'll audition and they're auditioning with somebody who's reading with them. And it, maybe they have a scene or whatever. Let's assume they just have one scene, it's a three page scene, they're going to read that scene with a reader. It's a very typical audition <clears throat> and usually what happens in the casting process is the director then once they hear the actor read if they're at all interested in them they'll give them some direction on how to do it differently I'm looking at the character differently than that I think she's more playful I think she's more serious I think she's you know more stern she you know whatever in other words um, directors will almost always give a lot of results and that's okay, that's sort of the casting process. The actor is there to give results quickly. You know, I, I need more anger in this scene or whatever. <clears throat> and then they will have the actor do it again, okay? And now they're judging the actor on the actor's ability to adjust to this kind of, this new direction. I don't do that. I'll have the actor come in, the actor will read as soon as the actor has finished reading the scene. I will immediately start, start talking to the character and I will start interrogating the character. Now something really bizarre, someday maybe you'll see this, Karen, happens when the actor is not expecting this because usually they're not. <clears throat> For a moment, and it's a brief moment, a couple of seconds, you'll see this sort of flashes in their eyes like what's happening? He's talking to the character. I'll, I'll start asking the question character. And usually the character, I'll say to the character, she just read the scene, and I'll just say, well, that didn't go very well, did it? And let's say her name is Sophia. I said, Sophia, that didn't go very well either. I mean, your, your mother's really not listening, is she? And you can see the actor going through this moment, quick moment of adjustment, like what is going on? And then usually right after that, you see this, another little flash and wham, they'll go right back into the character because this is where the actor wants to be. The actor really doesn't want more direction. The actor really doesn't want, that's not what I was looking for. The actor doesn't want to hear any of that. The actor really wants to be the character. So I start talking to the character. I start interrogating the character. And I'll tell her, Sophia, this isn't going very well. Da -da, your mother didn't do that. And I'll start asking her questions and interrogating her. And then say, okay, let's, let's try, let, Sophia, I'm going to give you a chance. Let's try this again. Which means it's the second reading of the scene. There's been no direction whatsoever. There's only been interrogation. And she'll do the scene again, and the scene will change. Now, if the scene doesn't change after the interrogation, because what I've done is I've moved her internally, emotionally. If, this, she, if she gives the exact same performance, I'm going, can't use her. This actor is not shifting, she's not adjusting at all. I didn't ask her to adjust, but she's not adjusting internally. But that rarely happens. Getting back to the casting thing, let's say I have 10 actresses come in to read for this character, Sophia. I'm not looking for the best actress. I'm looking for the best Sophia. And there's a Sophia that exists inside every single one of them. And I want to meet that, the Sophia. I want to meet that character that, that is lurking inside each one of them. And I will base my judgment on what I witness and experience and in, in conversation with in the interrogation. So it goes beyond the scene, it goes beyond the reading. 
if I have 12 actors, actresses leading for Sophia, chances are they're 12 good actresses. And then how do you make a decision? So let's take an example. You know Sophia, well, her character type is she's vulnerable, she's insecure, but maybe she masks it with a certain outward confidence. So you know that that's who Sophia is. So you're trying to come see who each actor sort of is as Sophia, yeah. pull it out. Yeah. And if one of them maybe is a better actor, maybe they can cry on cue, great. But if you don't see maybe that insecurity or that vulnerability, yeah. then you know that's not the real Sophia. Yeah, if, if you say insecurity and vulnerability that's masked, and I could say to Sophia, if you had read Sophia, and I, I, could, I could say to so Sophia, Sophia, this is your mother, right? Your, your, mother, your mother just thinks you're a little girl, aren't you? you know, what, she never, never is never gonna let you grow up. When, when is she gonna start treating you like an adult? Now all I'm doing is building insecurity vulnerability and I can build that in about 30 seconds that she's feeling really weak and vulnerable in front of her and I say yeah but don't Sophia don't let her see it don't let her see it be a, you can be big show her now I'm building up the mask everything you just said I'm building up the mask I said don't let her see it don't let her see it let's go again now she'll go again and you'll get a totally different performance the thing was was she able to incorporate everything she just went through and how does it affect her when I see her go back to do the scene again that's that's the real test. Do you understand? So it's not acting. It's gone be, I've gone beyond acting now. I've gone way beyond it. And if, if the actress gives me the same performance again, I go, oh, she's got it locked in. She's got, you know, she's got a plan and she can't seem to move. And actually in that way of directing her in the casting process, I haven't asked her to do anything. I haven't asked her to change her performance at all. None. But she's not intuitively moving to this other level of yeah, Sophia. Yeah, if, if I do the interrogation and, she, and she's not, which means she hasn't really allowed it in. She sort of answered the question and then when I said do it again, she, she goes, the actor takes over. I don't want the actor to take over. I want her to release herself to a process. Is there a danger in someone being both a writer and director? Same project? There's so. a big one. Um, I think it, it, yes, there's both a danger and a huge danger and a huge advantage. Um, and a, lot, a lot of it depends on the personality. The huge advantage of, of a writer-director is potentially, possibly, and I say that possibly because it doesn't happen enough, is that the, as the writer, the director really understands the material very well and has a deep... Um, knowledge and experience and with these characters and with this story. So that's the possible huge advantage. The disadvantage or the danger is uh, getting back to, this is a big part of the weekend workshop we'll be doing, is that person, that writer director has lost a collaborator. The director lost the writer and the writer lost the director. In other words, it's one person. So the collaborative process is um, a part of the collaborative process is gone. And I work with a, I work with a lot of writer directors. And one reason I work with them a lot, because I'm a director and also a writer, is they will bring me in as the collaborator. I mean, I'll, I'll have, have writers <coughs> bring me a script that they're going to direct and said, okay, I'm right, still working on the script. You be the director. I go, got it. In other words, they want, they want, now, the, now they're getting the, the, they're wisely getting the collaborative process back, even though I'm not the director, but I'm approaching it from a director's point of view and critiquing it and looking at it and analyzing and breaking down and questioning them from a director's point of view. And then, because I continue working with them, uh, then when they're directing, I'm there protecting the script. You know, in other words, so I have become that other person, although I'm neither. I'm not the director and I'm not the writer. So there's that collaborative process that is uh, re really, really important and it's kind of sad. And the other thing, the negative is, I wrote it, I understand it, I'll know how to direct it. And that, that kind of arrogance can be really, really damaging because there's just, and then also I've run into producers say, well, he wrote it, he'll know how to direct it. You know, so people even outside of that one person believe, oh, they'll know. And it doesn't, there it's two such totally different disciplines, writing and directing. Don't assume because someone's written it that they will know how to direct it. Are you coming? Oh, well, I was just going to say it's probably a safer bet that they won't. 
I mean, I yeah. think that the, even though there, when you look at the Oscars and so on, there are a number of writer directors that, that reach that pinnacle and can do both. I think the likelihood is they won't do both jobs equally well, or they won't do both jobs superbly. You kind of alluded to this in your story about London, I think it was, where they were giving everybody a camera. Mm -hmm. to, but, but I think film school, for example, kids go to film school thinking, I want to make movies, I want to be a director, I've got to write my own, but all I really care about is getting behind the camera and doing that, mm -hmm. and they never really learn or don't even understand quite the value of, you got to know how to tell a story. Beyond knowing how to tell it visually, you got to understand a story and all those principles. I think when writers become successful writers and then move up to being directors, that might stand a greater likelihood in some cases of them doing both well because they've, they've yeah. proven the storytelling part and then usually what they'll do is surround themselves with cinematographer and editors and people who know those craft part of it mm -hmm. so well that they get a lot of support there. But finding somebody who, those are two hard jobs, finding somebody who does both superbly well at the same time, that's got to be a tough, yeah, a a tough very, order. Do both need a buffer from their own process? What do you mean by buffer? Well, someone to be objective and to stand, you know, you talked about when you are working with the director, then you're sort of protecting the script and then vice versa. So do they almost need some type of a buffer to do the same thing to protect? Well, I, th I think so. I think, you know, if that someone says I've written a script and I'm going to direct it, the more people they can involve that they trust that have uh, skills and knowledge of writing and directing that they can engage in the process and their process and allow themselves to listen to these other people or even a writer a director let's say a director who's written a script and wants to um, direct it and he's got the chance to direct it but he's not really really not that accomplished writer but he's an accomplished director even to come to someone like Michael say okay listen I'm gonna direct this thing and I've written it I want to come to you as just the writer Forget the directing part and look, you know, look at it from a writing side. In other words, if they're willing to go to other people and say, help me here. I mean, I get this sometimes with someone who's written something and they come to me and they're going to direct it. And they said, help me you know, understand how to direct it. So if they, if they can have that open, that, that courage, back to courage again, the courage to put themselves in, in front of somebody who really does know what they're doing. Even just go to another filmmaker that you can that has really done well, that's successful, that's that's you know made some you know as, as an accomplished filmmaker, and say, tell me what to do here. Tell me you know and and get, you know don't get trapped into the arrogance like I wrote it, you know there's the money, I'm going to direct it, I know what I'm doing. Don't get you know everybody around you will support that idea. You must know what you're doing. Don't get don't get seduced by that. And lastly, what's the reality of people being willing to relinquish that control? Again, lip service, people thinking, oh sure, not a problem, I'll bring in collaborators. But What's in the, the reality? The slim. Re slim. Very, very slim. I mean, I've worked with some directors who um, have come to me, they're not writer-directors, just come to me and they have a project, it's all financed, it's going to go, it's, you know, it's with a, someone like Miramax or something like that, and they come to me for support just on the directing side. And I'm amazed how many of them will fight me. Say, no, 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 I can't do it that way. I don't, you know, I, sometimes I say, well, why are you here? Why, you know, in other words, what, I, what I'm running into is that resistance for something new. You know, the resistance to hear a new way of, and this is what Michael's been talking about today too, the resistance of, you know, the, here's another possibility. Have you thought of doing it this way? Have you thought of staging it this way? Have you thought of approaching the character this way? And you can feel that resistance, they don't want to, so that courage and that ability to really listen, really listen and, t and take to heart what you're seeing, be willing to dismiss it later if you think it's not telling the story you want to talk about as Mike was saying earlier, say no, no, that's not the story I want to tell. I own, I just, you know, not that's outside the realm. And I say, great, if you're clear on that, that's fine. But that that resistance is, it's there a lot. It's sad. It's the same thing with writers. I mean, it's as a consultant, I'm get you're sort of saying the same thing. This doesn't happen a lot, but there are always the clients who come and you realize after working with them a while what they really were paying that money for, so you could 
uh, reinforce their belief that they're great. And they just want to, you to give a stamp of approval to what they've done so they can kind of you know, move on and feel mm -hmm. comfortable. And when you really get in and start challenging some of those things or going deeper with it, they're not really up for that. That, that isn't the norm, that's more rare. It, it's interesting here because I'm thinking about this and it feels like we sort of come full circle because if there's one thing I bet, bet we've said about 20 times in this whole interview, the same two words keep coming up, or same two ideas, and that is ask great questions and listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if, if, you have, if you have those two abilities and the courage to do that throughout, that's going to just elevate your talent as a writer, mm -hmm. director, or whatever. Just keep asking good questions and then listen. Yeah, many times on the listening side, I've, I've said to clients, because I, I can feel that they're not really listening. You, 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 I'm sure you get that thing where you go, uh, it's, and I say, are you listening? Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. I said, fine. But did you hear what I said? Yes. And they go, huh? Did you hear? In other words, like, like the, the words went through oh, them, yeah. but they kept going, you know? And many times I said, okay, tell me what I just told you. Just repeat it back to me. And sometimes they can't. Because there, I think you know, there's a there's a part of them that just keeps deflect. It goes through them and it, and it gets deflected mm -hmm. to somewhere else. But it is it is a um, I think it's one of the toughest things for any artist, writers, directors, actors, any artist, to be able to sit down and listen to <coughs> comments, critiques, analysis, ideas on their work. You know, I wrote this, I'm directing this, on their work, on their concept. And you're right, they, they want to hear, this is going to be great. They want to hear, this is a wonderful script. They want those accolades, that affirmation, that validation. Quite honestly, that's not our job. I mean, I can look at something, a director's work and say, you know, you're really good, but I'm thinking you could be better. My job is to make you better, which means we're going to get into a critique. My job is not to sit here and, you know, put gold stars on your forehead. Because that, that, who cares? You can do that by yourself. My, you came to me because you want to be better. But then there's a resistance. Yeah, but I don't want to hear the bad stuff. I don't mm. want to hear, I don't even hear how I could be better because that means more work, more study, uh, more concentration. It's or, also or, or, or very important, which, uh, sorry. Yeah, right. Or, which I think we both do, it means I as an artist have to move outside of my comfort zone which is what story is all about. Right. You get outside the comfort zone. I'm going to go out there where it's uncomfortable, where it's challenging, where there are risks, where there are obstacles. Oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, one of the things that's tough in our situation as consultants, and I haven't talked to you about this, but I guess you'd agree, is it's not necessarily because a writer or a director, whoever we're working with, is consciously resisting or has that ego, it's that when they need to be listening to us, we're competing with about five other voices going through their head because when you're getting critiqued like that, you're thinking immediately, I did it wrong, how can I make it better? I get, it, I get into that a lot with writers. I'll be working with them and we'll be talking about the script and they're jumping right to, how do I fix it? How do I fix it? And I'll say, Forget fixing. We're not fixing. We're just we're just talking about about the screenplay, and and trying to get them to relax enough that those voices are not drowning out whatever it is I'm saying, which usually isn't so much a critique. It is more just those questions and and kind of leading them to their own conclusions about what's working and not working in their script. Working meaning, are they realizing the vision they had to begin with for their story? But that, it's tough to listen in that situation. Even if you're not an egomaniac or something, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's so ripe for wanting to be defensive and also cure whatever the problem is, rather than just taking it in and trusting mm -hmm. that We'll get there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, one, one thing just to add to that, the, when you said, fine, but how do I fix it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I run into that a lot, which is, okay, and I'll, I'll show them a, a process or, or lead them to a discovery. 
and I can see their mind going, yeah, but how, how can we just get there? How can we just get there? Now I'm, when I'm teaching people how to work with actors, okay, but how can I just get them to do what I want? No, and I think that the frustrating thing for them is to realize this is a process. This is a process that I have to go through that's going to be a few, several steps, like working with you on a script. Like, I don't just, oh, my, Michael's not just going to tell me right now how to rewrite the scene and it's going to be fine and I'll write it down and then I'm done. No, I have to go through and I have to look at character and I have to look at arcs and I have, I have to look at a process. And it's the same thing when I'm working with actors. I have to look at a process to get to the result. So there's a lot of this wanting a quick fix or a quick technique or a quick trick. And the other, other thing you said about the, the voices in your head, I was consulting on a um, film that was eventually made by um, MGM and I was working with the director and we are working on the script and I was helping him see what the potential is in the script and the writer was there and where this could go and he kept going, oh, this is great, this is, but that's not what the studio wants. It's not what the studio wants. I said, no, 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 forget what the studio wants right now. Forget it. We're looking at a script. We're looking at a story. We're looking at what's potentially possible in this story. But he was so locked on, and I, I don't even know what he was thinking. I don't know what the studio had said to him. Mm -hmm. But he was so locked on that, and I'm sure they were saying you know, things like, make it funny. Don't make it too dramatic. And we we're probably looking at something more dramatic. Do you know what I mean? And so suddenly a, that voice was just competing yeah. with everything we were doing in the room. It's kind of like you said, as a director working with actors, as consultants, I feel like one of our main jobs is we've got to create a safe space. We've got to create a safe space for the creative person. You have to create it for directors you're working with. I have to create it for writers so they can trust, okay, wait, I get this now. He's not going to tear me apart. It's not going to be about that at all. It's just we're, we're taking a journey into what I wrote together and see what together we can discover that I might not have even realized yeah. was there and see where we can go together with it. And it's not going to be about good or bad, right or wrong, or I screwed up or I did great. It's just what's, what's there that we haven't discovered yet. Something just occurred to me. I don't, hopefully you'll agree with this. I think you will. Um, I can imagine going to a consultant like not you or me, but another consultant for screenwriting or directing and wanting tools, techniques, mm -hmm. tricks, whatever, that will work, you know, formulas that will work. And I think what Michael and I do, even if it's just one consultation, and I say this because you've consulted with me on a script I wrote, so mm -hmm. I've had that experience. But in one, it's not that. Actually what happens, and I think this is what happens when I work with directors, is we form a relationship. We're not quick fix people. Mm -hmm. We form a relationship between consultant and client and that in that relationship which is a conversation we're guiding them into a process, into a way of looking at not only that script or that film. I'm looking at, I'm going to help you <coughs> become a better director. You're saying I'm going to help you become a better writer. We'll work on this script right now. But it's, it's the relationship mm -hmm. with the consultant which is actually, in many ways, um, what all scripts are about anyway, is a relationship. In other words, it's, we, we, we also replicate, this is how, how you work together. This is how two people communicate. Do you know what I mean? I don't sit here as the teacher just tell you, do this and then you'll be fine. I can show you something, but then I'm going to help you, I'm going to work with you to bring you to the point that you can discover what I already know or what I'm already talking about. So it's, 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 a, it's a very nurturing relationship. It's not a dictatorial or academic, here's the answer, do it this way. Yeah, I hope so, certainly, because yeah. that's, that's what works, I think. Yeah.